Welcome to Get Sleepy, where we listen, we relax, and we get sleepy. I'm your host, Thomas. Thanks so much for being here. Tonight, we have a special selection of our favorite winter tales from the show, all stitched together to make an extra long episode that can accompany you for as long as you need through the night. They're all stories that I've read, so I hope having the consistency of my voice narrating the tales will keep you peacefully settled while you enjoy some rest. Make sure you're in a cozy, comfortable spot enjoying the warmth of your bed and the peace of this moment. Draw in a few deep breaths, keeping the exhales gentle and slow, helping your body to relax. And while you ease into a place of comfort and rest, we can begin our wintry tales. Sarah sits in her comfortable rocking chair, gazing happily out the window. Her right foot taps against the wooden floorboards as she rocks back and forth. Green tartan drapes hang on either side of her large living room window. Sarah changed out her sheer white summer curtains in favor of the thicker green ones a while ago, when the weather first started getting colder. The drapes are pulled back, letting in the delicate winter light. The window itself is tall and long, taking up most of the wall. Sarah's cabin is extra cozy at this time of year. Across the room, the red brick fireplace is lit. She listens to the firewood crackle and pop as it slowly burns. Earlier this afternoon, Sarah prepared some hot spiced cider Now, it's slowly heating on the stove in the kitchen down the hall. And she can't wait until she can enjoy a warm mug of it. The aroma of apple, cinnamon, and orange mixes with the scent of the fireplace in a most delightful and wintry way. Adjacent to the fireplace, Sarah has a vinyl record player. A classic winter tune plays softly in the background, adding to the sound of the crackling wood. Slowly, she gets up from the rocking chair, happily humming the familiar tune. Her soft, hand-knit socks glide across the floorboards with every step. She brushes a strand of hair back behind her ear as she moves closer to the fireplace. Sarah takes a fire iron from a metal rack on the hearth. Then she bends her knees, leaning in closer to the fire. One hand holds the tool and the other rests comfortably on her thigh. 
Using the metal poker, she carefully nudges the burning wood. The embers glow brighter, and the flames grow higher in response. A small gust of smoke travels up the chimney, along with a few sparks. She puts the poker back by the side of the fireplace and wipes her hands together, scattering specks of dust onto the floor below. The wood burns strongly now, creating a comfortable warmth in the living room. As Sarah stands up, she turns back around to face the window. Snow has begun to fall, and it paints quite a relaxing scene. Happiness always fills her within when it's snowing outside, and this moment is no exception. From where she's standing, the snow is all she can see out of the window. A bluish-gray backdrop meets the bright white powder in the distance. Many of the snowflakes appear thick and fluffy as they slowly drop from the sky. Others are petite and seem to fall to the ground a bit faster. She loves the idea of hygge, which is the Danish word for a feeling of coziness. Hygge is all about a sense of blissful comfort, wellness, and contentment. And it's most often enjoyed at home, especially on a snowy day like this one. For Sarah, candles take center stage when it comes to creating hygge. She especially likes it when they're accompanied by freshly baked treats, warm drinks, fuzzy socks, and a woolly blanket. A friend and neighbor of Sarah's makes her own candles from coconut wax. Sarah always gets some at the start of winter in case of power outages, and of course, for the homey factor. There is a wonderful sense of community where she lives. She and her neighbors may be out in the mountains, far from the city, but they have everything they need right here. And in this particular moment, Sarah knows she's in need of candles. She grabs a pack of matches from a wooden shelf filled with novels and travel guides on the wall to her right. She fiddles with the cardboard casing as she pulls out one small match. She then lights a couple of the candles that rest on the bricks above the fireplace. She cups her hands around the wicks to ensure they catch. But while these are nice and almost do the trick, there are still a few more to be lit for optimal coziness, Sarah thinks. So she waltzes over to the window as the record plays another jolly song. She has long taper candles resting in metal holders along the windowsill. She strikes another match against the side of the box. The sound of a spark and a sharp, smoky aroma fill her senses. Sarah cups her hand around the tops of three candles while she lights them one by one. 
she can feel the chill of the window against the back of her hand, and the warmth of the flame near her palm as she lights the final candle. She then takes a few steps back and admires her work. This is Huge, she thinks. After gazing around the room for a few moments, she remembers the cider she has warming on the stove. She follows the smell of cinnamon and apple down the hallway towards the kitchen. This is one of Sarah's favorite places in the cabin. Her kitchen is draped with English ivy and warm colors. A potted Norfolk pine tree sits at one corner of the room, resting on a side table. There is a door that leads out to the back porch, which is now covered in dusty white snow. Near the door is a polished wood countertop that wraps around two walls. There's a gap in the countertop for the gas stove. The back burner is set to a low temperature and a small bit of steam is rising up from a large pot that rests on top of it. She smiles as she breathes in the sweet, seasonal aroma. Sarah walks over to the pot, still wearing her fuzzy socks. They feel like pillows on her feet as they press against the wooden floorboards. Next to the stove is a ceramic vase filled with various cooking utensils. She chooses a large wooden spoon and then peers down into the warm cider heating in the pot. Whole cinnamon sticks and orange slices lazily float on the surface. Billowing steam drifts up towards Sarah's face, warming her chilly nose to a comfortable temperature. She then dunks the wooden spoon into the pot, making slow circles around the edge. The cinnamon sticks and oranges begin to intermingle and bounce off one another as she stirs. She's had the cider brewing at a low temperature for a couple of hours. Eager to taste it now, she fills the spoon with liquid. Holding it close to her mouth, she softly blows to cool down the drink before taking a sip. A warm sensation travels down to her stomach with the first taste of the warm cider. Sarah decides that a couple of hours has been just the right amount of time. So she turns the gas stove even lower, just high enough to keep the pot warm for a second serving. Then, she leans over to her left and opens a cabinet door, which creaks slightly on its hinges. She fiddles around a sea of mugs, searching for the perfect one. Soon, she finds what she's looking for. Sarah pulls out a green, boot-shaped mug that she bought at a festive market in Poland a few years ago. It's her favorite to use during the winter season. It has snow painted around the rim 
and snowflakes dot the rest of the cup. Along the foot of the boot, it reads the name of a Polish city, serving as a happy reminder of her winter trip. Sarah runs her finger across the name and smiles as she remembers wandering through the festive market, tasting delicious sweet treats and looking at trinkets holding this very same mug. Sarah closes the cabinet and finds a ladle in the same vase with the other cooking utensils. She carefully dips it into the pot and scoops up some of the warm beverage. A trickle of cider escapes from the ladle and drips back into the pot. After filling her mug to the very top with fragrant cider, she places the ladle on the countertop and leaves the kitchen. She walks down the hall, the sounds of the crackling fireplace and quiet music drawing her back to the living room once again. But when Sarah reaches the front door, which lies at the end of the hallway, she pauses. The door itself is wooden and large with a unique stained glass window at its top. Through it is a wraparound porch, with stairs leading down to the ground. Curious to see the snow working its wintry magic outside, Sarah slips on a pair of fuzzy boots. Before she walks out, Sarah holds the ceramic mug in both hands and brings it up to her nose. She takes a big, deep breath in, relishing the notes of cinnamon, orange and apple. Then she takes a sip, feeling the warmth of the drink move through her body. Perfect, she thinks. Putting a hand on the cool metal of the doorknob, she begins to turn it, still holding her hot cider in the other hand. As the door opens, the chill of the wintry day embraces her. A small shiver runs down her spine, and she grasps the mug a little tighter. Sarah doesn't mind the cold though. She's actually quite eager to feel its refreshing touch and see the pristine mounds of snow forming outside. She steps out onto her porch and closes the door behind her to keep the warmth trapped inside. She's grateful to be wearing an oversized cream turtleneck that's made of wool. She knitted it herself last winter, and now it's helping to keep her cozy as she moves into the brisk weather. Sarah takes a few steps further to the edge of the porch, past the overhang of the roof. A border of snow has already built up around the wooden railing here, where it's exposed to the open sky. She slowly reaches one hand out to catch a few snowflakes. Sarah watches as they melt away in the palm of her hand, soon replaced by new flakes, letting out a small, 
contented sigh, Sarah returns her hand to the warm mug of cider. The gently falling snow looks magical to Sarah as she gazes out over the landscape. She feels at peace as though she's been transported into a winter fairy tale. The mountains in the distance are also covered in snow. Many of the highest peaks have been snowbound for some weeks, but they look exceptionally divine in this moment. So do the pine trees whose dark green needles are brushed with snow, like icing sugar. In front of Sarah's house is a large hilly field. In summer, it's often covered in wildflowers, but right now, it's dusted in sparkly white fluff. Sarah imagines inviting her neighbors over to make snowmen. Though she lives in the countryside, tucked away from the hustle and bustle of city life, she has a tight-knit group of friends who live nearby. A while back, she set up a number of logs in a circle and put a fire pit in the middle. There, they could bundle up by a warm campfire, sip more hot cider, and embrace the beauty of the winter spirit together. As Sarah imagines this, she reminisces about making snowmen as a child. Back then, she lived in the city, Kids would gather at the local park after the first snowfall to make snowmen and snow angels. This always eventually turned into a good-natured snowball fight with other children in her neighborhood. Sometimes when the snow fell earlier than normal and her mother hadn't had time to take out her wintry wardrobe yet, she would slide thick socks on both of Sarah's hands so that she could still go outside and play. These memories make Sarah chuckle before she returns her attention to the scene in front of her now. The snow has started to get heavier and it looks like a storm is on the way. Sarah takes one last look at the tranquil landscape, at the field of snow with pine trees around it, and the rugged mountains in the distance. Now, the highest peaks are disappearing behind a curtain of dark, thick clouds. She turns to go back inside and opens the front door. She's greeted by a rush of warm air from within her cabin. It feels nice and cozy after so long outside. Then Sarah closes the door behind her and slides the chunky metal lock shut just in case there are any strong gusts of wind that accompany the storm. She shakes off the snowflakes that have accumulated on her sweater and glances down at her feet. Her boots thud against the floor as she casually kicks them off. She makes her way over to the living room and finds a spot on her thick, plush sofa. There's a tartan pillow 
to match the drapes. She picks it up and fluffs it between her hands before moving it over to where she'd like to sit. Then she settles herself into a comfortable position with her legs tucked up beneath her so they don't touch the chilly floorboards. As she does this, she takes another soothing sip of her warm drink. The sofa feels soft and comfortable. It's just the right distance from the toasty fireplace, whose logs are still burning nicely. After another sip of cider, her mug is empty. She'll have another cup in a while, once she's ready to get up off the sofa again. She bends forward and slides the mug across the coffee table in front of her. As she leans over, she notices her woven basket full of knitting projects resting under the table. She grasps it by its handle, feeling the rough wood in her hands. Then she pulls it towards her and lifts it up onto the sofa. She thumbs through the projects one at a time before deciding which to continue working on. Since the cold weather keeps her indoors more often, winter is the perfect time for knitting, Sarah thinks. Plus, making warm and soft garments is a favorite pastime of hers. In fact, she even finds herself working on scarves and sweaters during the warmer months in anticipation of autumn and winter, when she can wear them or gift them to others. For now, she's decided to continue making a winter hat out of wool from the Shetland Islands. She likes this particular Scottish wool because of its durability and the way it can handle any kind of weather, rain or snow. She holds two knitting needles in her hands and begins to work, stitch by stitch. She keeps yarn wrapped around her right index finger as she guides the strand around the left needle. Knit, knit, pow, pow. She says the names of the stitches quietly in her head as she gets into the rhythm. Sarah is about halfway finished with this olive green hat. She plans to spend the rest of the evening knitting it to perfection. She's idyllically positioned herself on the sofa where she can enjoy the warmth of the fire and the lovely view of the falling snow. She hears the wind outside, the crackling and popping of the firewood, and the soft tunes coming from the record player. She watches the candles twinkle against the backdrop of a winter wonderland. And in this moment, Sarah feels completely relaxed. Knitting on its own helps to relax her, but the combination of it all has created a full, therapeutic winter treatment for any stress. Perhaps she'll return to the kitchen and pour another aromatic cup of warm cider. But for now, she sinks 
deeper into the comfort of the sofa. She props her head on the tartan pillow and lays with her knees up. She then closes her eyes and listens to the ambient sounds around her. The wintry combination of music, wind, and fire intermingle, making the room a safe and cozy space. Sarah lets her senses take over. She rubs the chunky yarn with her thumb and fingertips as she hums along to the song on the record player. She then focuses on the sound of the fireplace and the whistling of the wind and snow outside. All of these sensations come together magically, and Sarah wishes she could bottle them up to keep for whenever she needs to relax. At this moment, nothing else matters. All of her problems seem to fade away, and a blissful coziness and sense of utter contentment take over. Soon, the greyish-blue sky out the window fades darker and darker as the snow continues to fall. And here, Sarah might remain until bedtime calls. cold air nips at your nose as you stand on the snow-covered hill overlooking the town. Down below, the windows of the tiny distant houses emanate a warm golden light. Some of the homes have strands of small multicolored bulbs hanging from their roofs. Even from here, you can see them twinkling cheerfully. The snow is bathed in a silver-blue light. It seems the whole world is aglow in the pearly luminescence of the full moon, and the cold air makes the faraway town look glassy and dreamlike. For a moment, you wonder what it would be like if you were a bird, able to spread your wings and fly high above the neighborhoods, circling lower and lower until you landed in front of a cozy home. Through the windows, you'd see a family inside, sitting down to dinner with smiles on their faces. Or maybe you'd find someone reading a book in a comfy armchair beside a crackling fire. But then, a whispering breeze returns your awareness to the present moment. As the night grows darker, the air gets colder. The hill you're on is exposed to the elements. You think it might be warmer down amongst the trees on the trail that brought you here. With a last look out over the sleepy town, you turn 
and trudge through the snow. You follow your own string of footprints back the way you came. It's been long enough that the prints have formed an icy crust. Your boots crunch through them, leaving the shape of their soles atop your older tracks. The air around you smells cold and invigorating. The temperature mutes the other scents that might be carried on the breeze, leaving only a hint of pine and the damp freshness of the snow. You fall into an easy rhythm of walking, where you're not really aware of how much time has passed. All you take in is your slow progress over the hill, then into the trees. Before long, you see that the forest now surrounds you on all sides, a glittering trail of pearly, moonlit snow leads you through the pines, which tower over your head. Their branches are frosted with a layer of white. Everything looks different at night. The shadows are longer, and even the trees seem taller, stretching up towards the starry black sky. After a while of going gently downwards from the top of the hill, the path evens out. You find yourself in a place where the trees have more space between them. The forest seems open here, though it's not a clearing exactly. The trail itself is lost in the wide patches of white between the dark trunks. You pause for a moment to get your bearings. First, you rotate in a slow circle, taking in the scenery around you. But when you're facing the way you started once again, you notice something you hadn't seen before. Only a few steps away, there's now a wooden post, painted red, with a rectangular sign on top. It reads, Platform 1, in elegant gold script. How odd, you think. What could the sign be referring to? There's nothing here but you, the trees, and the snowy trail. You glance behind you, over your shoulder. Just as you suspected, there's nothing there. But when you turn back, the forest has changed once again. Now, cutting through the white snow, is a set of gleaming silver train tracks. They extend out to both sides through the trees, beyond the reach of your vision. You're sure these tracks weren't here when you walked up the hill earlier. In fact, you're positive they weren't here just moments ago when you first reached this part of the trail. You close your eyes and rub your forehead gently. It's late. Maybe your imagination is just running wild, you think. But when you open your eyes, you see that the forest has been transformed. To your right is a wooden bench, painted the same red with a sign that reads, Waiting Area. 
just beyond is a small, old-fashioned building, whose windows are glowing like those in the distant town. The word station is printed above the door in fanciful writing. Curious to explore further, you walk slowly over to the station. Instead of going inside, you cup your hands around your eyes and peer through the window. The glass is rimmed with frost, and your breath fogs it slightly. The warm glow is coming from old-fashioned lamps, which illuminate another waiting area indoors, along with a ticket counter which stands empty. There's not a single other person in sight. Before you have a chance to wonder about how this all came to be, you hear the low, faraway echo of a whistle. Soon it's accompanied by a deep rumbling sound moving through the trees. Whatever train uses these mysterious tracks must be getting nearer, you think to yourself. Moving away from the window, you glance up and down the tracks, but can't see a train yet. So, you walk back over to the bench to wait. You hear the clear, loud whistle blow twice. The rumbling grows louder as the train chugs closer to the station. Before long, you can see a bright, round light in the darkness. It's on the front of the locomotive, heading down the tracks in your direction. As the train barrels towards the station, it sends up a fan of snow on either side. A large plough on the front clears the path ahead of it. A kind of fog billows out around it, mixing with the snow, as the train grinds to a halt in front of you. When it finally rolls to a stop, you can see that the frontmost part is adorned with a large, festive bow. Like the station, the train seems to be of a different time. It's an old-fashioned steam locomotive, with a round face and a smokestack. A friendly conductor in a navy suit with silver buttons steps down from one of the carriages. He looks both ways, and spotting you by the bench, waves you over. Hop on, he says with a smile. You ask where the train is going tonight. To see the magic of winter, he says. You tell him it sounds wonderful. But then, you realize that you don't have a ticket. Not to worry, he says, as he fishes a rectangular piece of paper out of his pocket and hands it to you. Looking down at it, you read the words printed in cramped black lettering. Ticket good for one way or round trip, with luggage or without. Welcome aboard the winter train. His eyes twinkle as he watches you read. What a strange and wonderful thing to have happen you think to yourself. 
For a moment, you consider giving him your thanks and then continuing on your way back home to bed. After all, it's not every day that you find a mysterious train in the woods and climb on board. As you're pondering this, a single fluffy snowflake lands on your coat. The first is followed by another, and another. You glance up at the sky. It's as though you're standing in a snow globe, watching the flakes drifting down around you. Just like magic, you think. That thought makes your decision for you. This isn't the kind of opportunity to let pass you by. With a smile, you step up into the carriage. The conductor ushers you further inside and asks you to follow him to your very own compartment. This is a sleeper train, he explains, so you'll be able to sit up and watch the landscape go by for as long as you'd like, and then curl up into a cozy bed and fall asleep to the rocking motion of the train. You follow him past rows of comfortable-looking seats. Their midnight blue fabric with silver trim matches the curtains pulled back on either side of the large observation windows. Through the glass, the snowfall outside takes on a dreamy quality, as do the tall pines that line the tracks. The conductor leads you into another carriage. Instead of seats, this walkway is bordered by walls, with doors at regular intervals. These are the sleeping compartments, he explains. Yours is the last one on the left. He stops in front of your door and turns the handle to open it. Then, he gestures for you to enter, while he waits in the hall. You thank him for his help, and he smiles broadly, wishing you a good journey. He leaves you to settle in. You take some time to look around your compartment. It's a compact space, but it feels very homely. There's a bed with a fluffy pillow and a warm, fuzzy blanket. Beside it is a seat with a perfect view out the window. There's a little table with a silver tray on top holding small pots of tea and cocoa, along with a plate of biscuits, both chocolate-dipped and plain. You pick up a biscuit and nibble at the corner. It's buttery and crumbles in your mouth. Setting the rest of it down on the plate, you pour yourself a cup of your hot drink of choice. You inhale deeply, enjoying the warm, familiar fragrance. And then you settle into the seat, so you can look out at the wintry landscape. As soon as you're comfortable, you hear the train's whistle blow twice. Then you feel a light rumbling beneath you as it begins to roll down the tracks. As it picks up speed, 
you relax into its rhythmic rocking back and forth as it chugs along through the forest. You lean your shoulder against the glass and gaze out the window passively. At first, the landscape looks much like the one you were walking through not long ago. Pine trees obscure the view of the sky, except for starry patches that peek through the branches. Every once in a while, you catch a glimpse of the moon. It's so bright, you almost feel like you must be in a dream. It's as though you've never seen the forest and the sky look so perfect, so alive. The tracks seem to cut their own path through the trees, following a mostly straight course. But then, you notice some mountains in the distance. Their rocky peaks are covered in a thick layer of snow, which softens their edges and angles. You watch them grow larger as the train moves closer. Before you know it, the tracks are curving around the base of the first mountain. The steep slope fills the window entirely, becoming a blur of moonlit white and grey. You feel your eyelids growing heavy with the effort of tracking the view you're speeding past. For a moment, you let them drift closed, leaning your head against the cold glass. You rock back and forth in the comfortable seat, your body giving into the motion easily. All thoughts evaporate from your mind as the train's movement lulls you into a sense of peace and contentment. You can feel your awareness drifting too, into the familiar darkness behind your eyelids. When you open your eyes, some time later, you see that the train has left the mountains behind and is now traveling through a different forest. This one is unfamiliar to you. The trees are much larger than the pines you walked through earlier, their trunks gnarled with age. This looks like an enchanted forest to you, with its dusting of white snow. Just then, you see something moving between the trees. You press your face against the glass, trying to get a clearer view. Soon, you can make out that it's a silver sleigh with gold bells hanging from every corner. You imagine that you can almost hear the ethereal jingling through the window. The sleigh is being pulled by four beautiful white horses. Their hooves kick up a spray of powder with every step. Riding in the sleigh are two women with long dresses the color of snow. They sparkle in the moonlight, as do the crowns on their heads, which look as though they're made of icicles. The one on the left is wearing a small circlet, while the one on the right has a crown with tall spires of ice 
interlaced with gold. The mysterious women ride parallel to the train for a while, but soon the locomotive outpaces the sleigh. You glance back to see the horses trotting over an embankment of snow. Who could they be, you wonder? They looked like royalty and seemed perfectly at home in the enchanted winter forest. As you're pondering their identity, the train rocks gently and pulls to the left. As the tracks curve in that direction, you're afforded a view into new parts of the forest. The first thing that catches your eye is a circle of tall, evergreen trees in the distance. They seem to be twinkling in every color of the rainbow. As the train moves closer to them, you see that each of the trees is magnificently decorated. One is covered from top to bottom in gingerbread ornaments. There are small biscuit people painted with icing sugar and suspended from ribbons, along with houses, flowers, trees, and more. You can almost smell the spicy aroma of ginger and molasses wafting through the glass. The next tree is simply strung with cranberries, pine cones, and cut paper snowflakes. You appreciate its simplicity and attention to detail. A third and fourth tree are color-coordinated. One is blue and the other green. All of the ornaments and decorations they carry match their own respective color. And the largest tree of them all is hung with tinsel and fairy lights some white or gold, and others in every color imaginable. It stands taller than all the rest, casting its warm and welcoming glow on the trees beside it. Even beneath its trunk, the snow sparkles like a gemstone as the light bounces off of it. It's a truly enchanting scene. You wonder who decorated this group of trees, and if they ever pass by, just as you're doing, to admire their work. When the train turns again, you watch the decorated trees fade away behind you, and think of nights spent putting up ornaments, turning the ordinary into the extraordinary. The train rocks gently back and forth as you settle even more deeply into the seat. Around another bend, Something else in the forest catches your eye. It's a family of reindeer, happily standing together by a glistening stream, lapping up a drink of cold water. From this perspective, you can see that each of them is covered in a light sprinkling of powdery snow as though they've been walking around in it for a while. Their muzzles are especially dusted with white. It makes you smile 
to think of them nuzzling the snow and each other. As the reindeer disappear in the blur of magical forest behind you, you notice again how heavy your eyelids are feeling. It's been a long day, full of adventures and seeing new things. And now, you'd like nothing better than to lie down in the comfy bed stretch out your arms and legs and settle into the soft, fluffy pillow. So, you take one final sip of your hot drink, savoring its rich aroma and the feeling of it on your tongue. Then, you change into your pyjamas and crawl into bed, nestling down beneath the covers. From your bed, you have the perfect view out the window. You watch the trees and mountains fly past and even make out the individual snowflakes that are beginning to fall outside the train. Soon, you allow your eyes to fall shut and let your mind clear of the thoughts of the day. You settle into the soothing rocking of the train, back and forth as it lulls you nearer to sleep. Your mind is filled with the rhythmic sound of the train moving down the tracks. Tonight, you'll dream of white sleighs, twinkling trees, and reindeer by a stream. You'll dream of the magic of winter and of all that means to you on this perfectly enchanted night. The snow drifts gently past the window as Jacob opens his eyes. He's snuggled under a pile of warm, fuzzy blankets. He pulls them up to his chin and tucks his legs up close to his body, enjoying the comforting warmth of the bed. The heavier snowflakes stick to the glass. Jacob watches as they melt slowly and join the slush gathering on the wooden frame outside. It's so cozy here, tucked in bed on this chilly winter morning. He doesn't want to leave the tangled swirl of blankets But then, he remembers that today is special. This evening, he and his dad are going to Aunt Sarah's house for dinner. It's a family tradition that all the aunts, uncles and cousins get together at least once during Hanukkah. 
everyone makes different dishes to share. They eat a big meal, light the menorah, play with the dreidel, and stay up way past his usual bedtime. And this year, he and his dad are in charge of bringing the latkes. It's a big responsibility, especially since they'll be using his great-grandmother's famous family recipe. Jacob has never made latkes before, and he can't wait to learn how. He yawns and stretches his arms above his head. Then, he pulls his legs out from under the covers and slides his feet into a new pair of royal blue slippers. He's been growing like a weed, says his aunt Sarah. He outgrew his last pair of slippers in just a few months. This pair looks a little more grown up, more like his dad's. Wiggling his toes and yawning once more, he makes his way down to the kitchen. His dad is at the counter, putting the finishing touches on two plates of French toast. Jacob smiles. This is their special breakfast. His dad only makes French toast on birthdays, holidays, and other extra special occasions. Jacob walks over to the refrigerator and takes out the orange juice and milk. He pours himself a glass of juice and carefully puts a splash of milk in his dad's coffee cup, just the way he likes it. Then he gets out two knives and forks and the bottle of maple syrup. Sitting down at the table, Jacob swings his legs back and forth under his chair in anticipation. His dad claps his hands and turns around with a wink. He sprinkles some icing sugar on top of both stacks of French toast and nestles a few perfectly ripe raspberries around the golden squares. He sets one plate down in front of Jacob and the other at his place at the table. With a warm smile, he says, enjoy, and they both begin. The French toast is warm and buttery. The icing sugar on top gathers together in delectably sweet mounds of white. Every mouthful is the perfect marriage of salty and sweet, made even better by the gooey syrup and crunchy crust. Jacob uses the final piece of toast to soak up the last of the maple syrup and sugar and finishes with a delightfully tart bite of raspberry. With breakfast over, Jacob's dad tells him it's time to get ready for the day. They wash up the plates and pans together before Jacob heads back to his bedroom to get dressed. He'll put on one of his nicer shirts before they go to Aunt Sarah's house. But for now, 
he chooses some comfy clothes. One of his favorite old t-shirts and a pair of red sweatpants make the perfect outfit for cooking. When he's dressed, Jacob walks down to the kitchen, where his dad is already starting to prepare their workspace. On the table, he finds an old piece of paper that's yellowed around the edges. This is a copy of his great-grandmother's recipe, Jacob's dad tells him. Your great-grandmother, my grandmother, was famous for making the best latkes in the family, he says. Our mother made copies of lots of her recipes to give us. Me and Aunt Sarah and Uncle David, when we were old enough to cook. Now it's your turn to learn. Hearing these words, Jacob feels proud that his dad trusts him with a task like this. He knows how important it is for everyone to have latkes during Hanukkah. They are always one of the most special dishes. Every year, his aunts and uncles and cousins taste the crispy, savory potato pancakes and share their memories of celebrations past. For some reason, these little fried pancakes seem to be the key to his family's most treasured memories. Jacob never got to meet his great-grandmother, but he's heard all about her over latkes at Hanukkah meals. She was kind and caring, but also feisty and determined. Once she made up her mind to do something, she did it, Uncle David always says. This year, Jacob decides he'll be just like his great-grandmother. He'll learn how to make the best latkes and carry on this family tradition. First, Jacob's dad tells him to pick out several of the best potatoes from the bin in the pantry. Jacob opens the pantry door and peeks inside. It's dark, so he pulls the hanging cord above his head to turn on the single light bulb on the ceiling. Jacob gets down on his hands and knees and slides the bin in front of him. Then he runs his hands over the rough, brown potatoes, one by one. The earthy and familiar scent of dirt reaches his nose as he moves the vegetables around in their bin. Soon, he has a fine collection of large and medium-sized potatoes in his arms. Jacob carries them over to the sink and begins to wash them off. He uses a coarse brush to scrub any remaining dirt off the skin. As he washes and scrubs, Jacob looks out the kitchen window. Snow is still falling outside, making the yard look like a winter wonderland. It's almost as if their house is inside a snow globe that someone just shook up, J. 
Jacob thinks to himself. He watches a few large snowflakes drift by and land on one of the bushes by the window. Before long, they are covered in a fine layer of snow. That reminds him of the icing sugar on the French toast this morning, and the thought makes him sigh happily. He scrubs even harder, knowing the latkes will taste just as good, if not as sweet. When he's finished, he carries the potatoes over to where his dad is standing by a large bowl. The next step is to grate the potatoes into the bowl, his dad says, nudging the handle of the grater towards him. Carefully, Jacob slides a large potato up and down the side of the grater, watching as thin slivers fall down into the bowl below. It doesn't take long for him to find the perfect rhythm. Up, down, swoosh, swoosh. The potato's damp interior makes a satisfying noise as it glides along the metal circles of the grater. As he works, His dad explains to him that there are some tales he should know if he's going to be a keeper of the family tradition. Jacob looks up at his dad, who winks at him. He's brimming with curiosity. He thought he was just going to learn a recipe. He didn't realize there were stories too. Have you ever wondered why we eat latkes? His dad asks. Jacob nods. Well, first of all, latkes is the Yiddish word for pancakes, his dad tells him. And originally, the pancakes were made of fried cheese instead of potatoes. This is surprising to Jacob, who's only ever had the potato kind, or the sweet type of pancakes you eat with syrup in the mornings. Images of stretchy mozzarella sticks come to Jacob's mind. Fried cheese pancakes don't sound bad at all. Once, A long time ago, an Assyrian general named Holofernes was holding the town of Bethulia under siege. A brave woman named Judith wanted her town to be free. She fed him salty pancakes filled with salty cheese. When he became thirsty, she gave him wine to drink, so much that he eventually fell asleep. Then she took his sword and triumphed over him. I'll save the details for another time, he says with a grin. As his dad tells him the story, Jacob moves on to the second potato, then the third, until they are part of the mountain of shavings piled high in the glass bowl. His dad continues. Nobody knows why the story of Judith became linked to Hanukkah, but it did. And even as far back as the Middle Ages,
people were eating these cheesy pancakes during the holiday to commemorate Judith's bravery. Jacob pauses his grating with a puzzled look. So why do we eat potato pancakes now instead of cheese ones? Well, his dad says, potatoes were cheap and easy to buy. So, for many people, especially those from Eastern Europe many years ago, they became a staple. It just made sense to start using them in the pancakes too. It was all about adapting to what they had. It does make sense to Jacob, though he can't help but think that someday it would be fun to make cheese pancakes too. He tells this to his dad, who laughs. Let's try it next year, his dad suggests. With a happy grin, Jacob finishes grating his final potato. Now that he's done with that task, it's time to remove as much of the excess liquid from the shavings as they can. His dad explains that the latkes will hold together better and have a nicer consistency if the potatoes are squeezed out first. They pile the potato shavings into a piece of cheesecloth and twirl both ends. Slowly, Jacob watches as water drains out of the bottom. When the shavings are as dry as possible, Jacob mixes them with some eggs and flour, salt and pepper. Meanwhile, his dad eats up a generous amount of oil in a heavy pan on the stove. When it's hot enough, Jacob gathers large spoonfuls of the potato mixture and drops them slowly into the pan. He isn't usually allowed to cook with oil, but since his dad is here to help him, it's okay. Soon, the smell of frying potato fills the warm air of the kitchen. It's so savory and salty, he thinks, and it's also comforting. His dad has been the one to bring latkes to the family dinners before, so Jacob has grown up with these scents all around him. They make him think of joyful times with his family, good food, and special moments with his dad. As he scoops the little pancakes into the oil, his dad continues his story. A very long time ago, long before even your great-grandmother's grandmother was born, he says with a smile, there was a man named Judah Maccabee. Like Judith, he and his followers were victorious. They triumphed over a Syrian Greek king. Jacob looks thoughtfully at his dad as he plops another pancake into the oil. But what does that have to do with latkes? Jacob asks. His dad smiles, removing the first batch of golden pancakes from the oil and setting them on a paper towel to drain. 
after Judah Maccabee and his followers reclaimed one particular temple, they prepared it as best they could. But they only had enough oil to light the menorah, the lamp, for one night. They lit it, and it burned for eight days. That's often called the miracle of light his dad explains. So now, we eat foods cooked in oil during Hanukkah, because it reminds us of that oil that burned for so many days. Jacob listens as his dad's voice mingles with the crackling sound of the hot oil. The flickering flame of the stove dances slightly beneath the heavy black pan as the latkes turn a beautiful golden brown. Outside, the snow falls steadily on the yard and all the trees. Somehow, these little potato pancakes do bring out the most amazing stories, Jacob thinks to himself. Whether it's stories of his great-grandmother in her hometown, tales of all the trouble he and his cousins get into together, or these being passed down by his dad now, they are all magical in their own way. As the last of the latkes are flipped over and then removed from the pan and set gently on the paper towel, Jacob takes a deep breath. He loves the warm and comforting smell of potato pancakes mixing with the lighter scent of hot oil. His dad rests a hand on his shoulder. Well done, Jacob, he says. Now you know how to make your great-grandmother's famous latkes. Jacob beams with pride and happiness. He is grateful for his whole extended family and for his dad in particular who is always there for him, no matter what. And now that he knows how to make regular latkes, there's nothing standing in the way of him making cheese pancakes next year. The thought makes him giggle to himself. Jacob's dad tells him it's time to get ready to go. They'll head over to Aunt Sarah's house soon, so everyone can enjoy the latkes while they're still warm. Jacob finds one of his favorite shirts in his wardrobe and pulls it on. By the time he meets his dad back in the kitchen, they are both dressed for the occasion. While his dad packs up the latkes in a few containers, Jacob finds jars of both apple sauce and sour cream to accompany them. He knows a lot of his cousins don't like sour cream but he does, as do most of the adults. His favorite thing to do is alternate bites. Sour cream, apple sauce, back and forth. It gets the perfect mix of sweet and tart with the savory potato. He can't wait to try some of the latkes, 
and imagines they'll taste even better this year, knowing all the work that went into making them. Just moments later, Jacob and his dad are wrapping themselves up in coats and scarves and heading out the front door. While his dad warms up the car, Jacob takes a moment to appreciate the wintry world all around him. The snow is falling peacefully, and the only sounds are the familiar ones of home. On this day, Jacob feels the love of his family surrounding him, through his dad, through the food they cook together, and through the stories they share. There are many different ways in which one might explain what hygge actually is. It's often linked to coziness and comfort, but also to friendship and togetherness, ritual and tradition. And really, it's hard to put into words what hygge means. Like love or happiness, We struggle to describe it, but we know it when we feel it. It's the essence of safety and comfort, or the magic of the holidays you experienced as a child. It's like listening to a thunderstorm from the comfort of your bed with freshly laundered sheets. Like a familiar scent that stops you in your tracks and reminds you of a loved one. Or a taste of the delicious pie your grandmother always makes. It's a sense of being home, no matter where you are. One might describe a particularly cosy looking living room as being hoogly, or hygge-like. You can use the word to describe a lovely scarf, a family recipe, or a particularly nice candle. And yet, it's also something that can be done. You can reminisce about your wonderful weekend and the hygge time that was had by all. The written word can be traced back to the 1700s at a time when Denmark and Norway were part of a union. As a spoken word, its roots run far deeper. Examining these roots can help to establish a better understanding of what tuge truly means. In terms of etymology, Hygge can be linked to older words, meaning to embrace, to give courage or comfort, and to think or consider. The modern word used today is typically translated as coziness. So whilst its precise origin is unknown, a combination of these paints a clearer picture. Hygge is a feeling of comfort, physical, mental, and emotional. It's a time to be mindful, thoughtful, and considerate of those around you, 
as well as yourself. Who gave feeds your sense of well-being like a loving hug from an old friend? Being that it's linked to the enjoyment and traditions of each individual, it's entirely possible to experience huge year-round. One might feel it in July at a potluck barbecue with friends and family, or at the dinner table in October as you share the events of your day over a homemade pumpkin soup. You might feel it in April as you stand at a window and watch the rain fall outside, or in January as you settle in for your monthly movie night with friends. But Tugi is most commonly associated with the winter season. After all, it's during this chilly and festive time that so many of us celebrate the rituals and traditions that evoke feelings of warmth and comfort. It's during the holidays that we create the kind of magical experiences that live on in our memories. And it's through this period, too, that we tend to seek out our creature comforts the most. When days are short and the temperatures are icy, there's nothing quite like the pleasure of a warm blanket and a cup of hot chocolate. Perhaps this speaks to the mindset of the North when it comes to huge and well-being overall. Rather than bemoaning the coming of winter, it's preferable instead to find countless ways of embracing it. With a focus on huge, one might create endless opportunities to express gratitude in any season or circumstance. One of the best ways to really know what Huge might look like and feel like is to experience it for ourselves. So, let's do that now. Let's travel to Denmark and step into the coziest scene imaginable. Picture a wintry countryside the hilly landscape is covered in a blanket of thick white snow. The days are short, and though it's only late afternoon, the light is already fading. Step by step, you trudge along the flat, snowy path, relishing the comfort of your clothing. Your coat feels lovely and soft wrapped around you, offering warmth and protection. This warmth extends to your feet and hands by means of heavy boots and woolen mittens. Your scarf and hat are equally snugly. All around you, the light continues to dim. The falling snow becomes brighter against the dark blue sky. And you watch, enchanted, as it dances and twirls upon the horizon. The quiet stillness of your surroundings is punctuated only by the sound of your own boots crunching through the snow underfoot. In the distance now, you see your destination, a beautiful log cabin radiating golden light from its windows and smoke from its chimney top. It's encircled by huge fir trees their emerald leaves brushed with white powder. 
Behind the trees, tall mountains look on in peaceful silence. It's like a scene from the front of a holiday card, inviting you to step inside this winter wonderland. Already, you're gaining a sense of what Hugi might be. And this feeling is only amplified as you shake the snow from your boots and enter the cozy log cabin. You remove your coat, along with your hat, gloves and scarf, and lay them across a mahogany stand in the entranceway. Taking off your shoes and socks, you replace them with fuzzy slippers laid out beside the door. Their design is playful, with giant white snowflakes on a vibrant red background. Small white pom-poms dangle from the top seam. You notice that your own name has been embroidered onto the right one which makes you realize that these are just for you. You feel a childlike sense of joy as you slip them onto your feet. Inside, your toes are toasty warm. Now you pause and admire the cabin's interior. Glossy wooden floorboards are covered with thick, luxurious rugs. The walls are painted a creamy off-white. To your right, there sits a beautiful, red three-piece suite, just behind a rustic oak coffee table. Directly opposite the sofa is a crackling log fire encased with a stone fireplace. Its bright golden flames dance up toward the chimney, spreading light and warmth across the whole room. To your left is an open-plan kitchen with smooth marble countertops, lined with jars of various delights. At the end of the kitchen is a stove. A single pan sits atop an unlit burner. You walk over to it and find a large porcelain mug and a spoon positioned on a tray beside it. There's also an assortment of little jars. One jar contains tiny pink and white marshmallows, and another holds thick clotted cream. Three more reveal shaved curls of milk, dark, and white chocolate. One at a time, you bring each container towards your nose, closing your eyes briefly and taking in the sweet, creamy scents. The pan is full of cold milk. You turn on the heat and reach for a wooden spoon. You use it to stir the milk gently as it warms, forming swells and ripples across the surface. How nice it feels to slow down like this, to be so completely absorbed in the simple action of stirring milk in a pan. Occasionally, your attention drifts to the cozy feeling of your slippers, or to the sound of the crackling fire in the living room. Your gaze wanders to the window above the stove where brilliant white snowflakes continue to twirl in the darkening night. And all the while, the sound and motion 
of your arm stirring the wooden spoon through the warming milk is soothing and lovely. Eventually, steam begins to rise from the pan, and tiny bubbles appear in clusters across the surface of the milk. Turning to the tray, you spoon a mix of chocolate shavings into the mug, and then carefully pour the milk over them. You stir the hot chocolate gently, delighting in the scents that waft up from the mug. To finish it off, you drop in a spoonful of clotted cream and top it with fluffy marshmallows. With mug in hand, you step into the living room and take a seat on the plush fabric of the sofa. Bringing your feet up towards you, you lean back into the ruby red cushions and gaze into the fireplace opposite. How mesmerizing it is, you think, the way the flames rise and fall from the glowing logs at their base, and the way the fire's warmth moves across your face. Even as you begin sipping the creamy hot chocolate, your eyes remain fixed upon the raw beauty of the fireplace. In this moment, you feel utterly content. You find yourself feeling a little reflective too, Perhaps it's because the scent and taste of this wintry drink is filled with memory and meaning. You're reminded of happy moments from your youth that were steeped in love and kindness. You think of the warmth of family and friendship. These feelings wash over you as you drink sip by sip. This is Huge, you think to yourself. No sooner has the thought crossed your mind than you hear a gentle knocking at the front door. Having emptied the mug, you set it down upon the coffee table climb off the sofa, and head to the door. When you open it, you're delighted to see a small group of your friends. Like you an hour ago, they are bundled up in thick winter coats, and their cold faces are partially hidden by woolen scarves and hats. They're a merry bunch, too, laughing and joking about the temperature as they swap boots for slippers. They drape their outdoor wear across the wooden stand, just as you did. Then, one by one, your friends greet you with a long, heartfelt embrace a hug that warms you from your smile to your slippers. Now the evening can truly begin. Two of your friends head into the kitchen, while another motions towards a record player in the corner of the room. She begins flicking through your record collection occasionally poking fun at your taste in music, as friends do. That results in a bout of hearty laughter from all. The conversation flows so easily and naturally, as if you've never been apart. Eventually, 
your friend picks out a record that all of you can agree upon. She puts it on, and the first notes drift through the joy-filled room. Then, she comes to join you on the couch, where together you sit and listen quietly. There's something rather lovely about the sound of vinyl, you think regardless of what's playing. Even before the music begins, you enjoy the sound of the table turning, the needle touching the grooves, and the crackle of the record. It fits the ambience of the evening perfectly. Your other friends enter the living room now, carrying a tray with delicious snacks. In the center of the coffee table, they set down a charcuterie board. There are thick wedges of all your favorite cheeses, along with sun-dried tomatoes, peppers, and olives, drizzled with oil. Their bright colors are vivid in the firelight, There are also thin slices of freshly baked bread beside a softening block of golden butter. Around the outside of the board is a wonderful selection of sweet treats. There are swelled knots of sugared pastry, ginger snaps, biscuits dipped in chocolate, and much more. Each of you takes a plate and fills it with whatever you'd like. You eat slowly, savoring every bite from first to last. You're struck by how lovely this moment is. It feels wonderful to be surrounded by friends, enjoying the tastes, textures, and aromas of good food. Once you've finished the main course, you and your friends move on to the sweets and pastries. You take a piece of buttery shortbread and a bite of soft yet crumbly fudge. One bowl in particular stands out amongst the others. It's bright red and homemade in appearance. Lifting it up to the firelight, you see your own name painted on the side. Glancing at your friends, you realize they've brought this special treat just for you. Looking inside, you see a kind of sweet that you haven't had since you were a child. You must have mentioned it to your friends at some point and they remembered. The realization fills you with feelings of acceptance and care. You pick one out of the bowl and bring it to your lips. You enjoy it slowly and mindfully, basking in the familiar taste and texture. It's just as you remember it. To you, this is one of the tastes of your childhood, and it's magnificent. How lucky you are to have friends like this, who would make such a thoughtful gesture. As you sit together, reminiscing about times long past, you feel wholly connected to the people around you. A little while later, someone suggests playing a board game. Each of you helps to clean up the table, carrying plates and bowls into the kitchen 
and stacking them neatly by the sink. One of your friends begins setting up the game on the wooden table, reading the rules aloud and asking that you each choose a playing piece. Another friend kneels beside the fireplace, adding fresh logs from a wicker basket on the stone hearth. With a metal poker, he carefully arranges the logs amongst the burning embers. You walk over to the record player, where the sound of the music has been replaced by the needle on spinning vinyl. You stop the record and pick it up. It's a gentle procedure, requiring care and delicacy. In fact, your hands barely touch the outer edge of the circle as you turn it upside down and set it back upon the player. Then you lift the needle before slowly lowering it onto this side. Seconds later, music begins to play once more. You're about to sit down when you catch sight of the cabin window and the darkness that has settled outside. Even with the fire, the room would benefit from a little more light. From a wooden shelf positioned above the mantelpiece, you take down a set of white pillar candles resting on circular brass stands along with a single box of matches. You position each one safely around the room. Then you strike the match and light each candle. The candles illuminate the game board and the faces of your companions with their soft, golden glow. And now, you sit upon the fluffy rug between the hearth and the table, facing your friends. With the fire behind you, every inch of the board is visible. Although the sofa was luxurious, it somehow feels even cosier to sit like this upon the floor. You take off your slippers now that your feet are warm and toasty and curl your bare toes into the fabric of the rug. Outside the cabin, The snow continues to fall, drifting idly in the evening breeze. It's a beautiful, wintry scene to behold, even more so when enjoyed from the warmth and comfort of the cabin. For the next hour or two, you and your friends play the board game, laughing joking and reminiscing along the way. From your seats around the table, you lean forward in turn to move your game pieces, roll the dice and read out questions to the others. You are fully present, experiencing the light-hearted fun of the moment. It occurs to you now that a new memory is being created, one that you will treasure in the years to come. You'll no doubt reminisce about this night down the road. How might you recall it, you wonder? Perhaps you'll think of that wonderful evening in the log cabin with the blazing fire and warm toes, despite inches of snow outside. Or you'll remember the cosy night 
you drank hot chocolate, played board games, and listened to old records. The memory might flicker back when you're next stirring a pan of warm milk, lighting a candle in the darkness, or hugging an old friend. As the night draws on, some of you begin to yawn. The flames have faded away, though the charred embers left behind occasionally glow ruby red. Soon, each of you will head off to your respective bedrooms, where a deep and dreamy sleep awaits. Not before you hug once more and offer words of heartfelt gratitude for the pleasure of each other's company this evening. What a marvelous night this has been. Each of you takes a candle, exchanges your final good nights, and walks to a different door one slow step at a time, you find your way to the comfort of your bedroom. Here, you place the candle upon the nightstand and change into silky, full-length pajamas laid out upon the bedsheets. They're soft against your skin and a perfect contrast to the thick blankets. You slide into bed under the massive cloud-like duvet and snuggle down under the covers. Above your head, a circular window offers a view of the wintry landscape. You gaze through it into the pitch black night, where the snow dances so gracefully on the breeze. Such a scene only makes you feel even more grateful for the comfort and warmth of your bed. And now, it's time to rest. You take a deep breath in, and then let out a happy sigh, allowing your eyes to close. Then you drift off into a deep and comfortable sleep on this cozy night. The smell of firewood lingers in the air. It mixes magically with the aroma of chocolate and coffee and creates the perfect mood with the snow falling outside. You clutch a mug of hot chocolate between both hands. You can feel the warmth of the drink sinking into your skin, sending a warming sensation through your body. You bring the hot chocolate up to your nose and breathe in the sweet, slightly minty aroma. You're sitting in a quaint coffee shop 
in northern Finland. This special region is called Sapmi, or Lapland, and it's covered in snow for more than half the year. It's located above the Arctic Circle, after all. These wintry months make it a unique place, and the life and culture here are fully intertwined with the long nights and snowy weather. The coffee shop is set inside of a traditional hut resembling a log cabin. However, it has a more triangular shape and features a large stone fire pit in the middle of the room. Polished wooden picnic-style tables also dot the cafe's interior. The place is perfectly warm enough for a turtleneck jumper, but your long winter coat hangs on a wooden rack across the room. You can hear the sounds of mugs clinking together as a woman washes dishes behind the counter. Around you are locals and other visitors to this wondrous region of Finland. You hear a mixture of languages, from English and Finnish to Russian and Spanish. Dim yellow lights create a moody, rustic atmosphere in this place. They are situated on metal fixtures that are sprinkled evenly around the room. Outside, it is already getting dark. Days are short here. However, you can still see some color in the sky as you look out at the wintry scene. Fresh snow is falling, almost in slow motion, onto a thick blanket already covering the ground. In the distance, you can see other shops and homes in the village. You can even make out the cabin where you will be spending the night. All of the buildings have the same soft, yellow-tinted lights, and the color creates a beautiful glow against the snow. Snow-covered trees are also scattered around the village. This scene looks so magical that you want to capture a memory of it. You unzip your backpack and rustle through a set of gloves, a journal, and even a pair of ice skates. They sit at the bottom of your bag, secured safely. You touch one of the laces and remember how excited you are about the rest of your day. Soon, you find your phone. It feels cold to the touch. You open your camera app and shift your body towards the window. You hold up your phone as you tap the screen to adjust the focus. Then, you proceed to snap a few photos before bringing it back down. You admire the last photograph until the screen light fades. Then, you promptly turn off the phone and place it into your backpack. The zipping sound of the bag mingles with the crackling of firewood next to you. 
Now, you turn your gaze to the table and pick up the ceramic mug of hot chocolate. You bring it up to your nose and breathe in softly before taking a sip. You hold the warm cup for a while, sipping it every so often as you admire the scenery both inside and out. Soon your mug is empty and you place it back down on the wooden table. You then gather your backpack and scoot off of the wooden bench you've been sitting on. You smile and wave goodbye to your server as you gently remove your coat from the rack. Soon, you reach the curved door that leads out onto a small, front-facing patio. As you grab the handle, you can feel the chill of winter embrace you. You open the door and feel the cold sensation move over your body, but just for a moment. Your layers and thick coat are ready for even the coldest of days. Before heading off, you take a seat on a bench adjacent to the door. The spot is under the roof and free from snowfall. You unzip your backpack and pull out a pair of warm, woolly gloves. You slide them on one by one and adjust the finger sections until they feel perfectly snug on each hand. Now you are ready, you think. As you stand back up, you let out a deep breath. You can see the warmth of it lingering in the air for a few moments before it fades away. You have rented a kick sled for the duration of your trip. It's one of the best ways to get around these snow-filled, and unsalted roads. Your kick sled is mostly made of wood. It has a chair mounted onto a pair of metal runners, almost like a set of skis. At the top, there are sturdy handlebars. Before entering the cafe, you left your sled just to the right of the building. You hear the soft sound of snow crumbling beneath your feet with each and every step. The kick sled is just how you left it, but with a bit of snow stacked up on the chair and handlebars. At this moment, a local man walks by. He tells you that there is a snow scraper just inside the shed next to you. You look over and notice the small outbuilding with a long door and quaint triangular roof, much like the cafe itself. Smiling, you thank him for his kindness. With a quick and strong tug, you're able to get the old door open. Pieces of ice had formed in the open spaces of the door, holding it shut. Before long, you notice the snow scraper and pull it out from behind a large rake. 
You then brush off the snow from the chair and handlebars of your kick sled. Then you place the scraper back where you found it and push the door firmly to secure it. Now you are almost ready to ride towards the forest, you think. You carefully stow your backpack in the chair of the kick sled, ensuring it will stay put. Then you step onto the kick sled, one foot at a time. You softly push off with the right foot, and then your left. Once you feel like your feet are in a comfortable position, you place your gloved hands onto the sled's handlebars. You imagine for a moment how cold they would feel without your woolly gloves protecting you. You then remove your dominant foot from the sled and push yourself and the kick sled forward with a strong step into the blanket of snow. Bits of sparkly flakes fly up like fireworks as you do this. Before you know it, you are on your way, navigating down the straight, snowy street of this arctic village. You take turns between gliding through the snow and kicking your foot against the ground to restore your speed. You continue to do this, passing village cabins and pedestrians along the way. In the distance, you can see the soft, pale colors of the sunset. Light shades of pink intermingle with the delicate blue of the sky. The colors darken as the moments pass. The sun sets early above the Arctic Circle at this time of year. The people here are used to the dark days and rare sunlight. They have learned to embrace it. That is why coziness, candles, and fireplace-lit cafes are common here. Soon, you pass by the man you spoke with just a few moments ago. He can probably hear you coming, thanks to the rhythmic whooshing sound of your sled against the snow. You wave and exchange greetings without slowing your speed. Tiny snowflakes tap your nose and cheeks as you navigate down the road. You feel happy in this moment, like you belong here. There is nowhere else you would rather be right now, you believe. As you kick out your foot again, a few children zoom past you on their own kick sleds. You feel a cold wind envelop you as they soar by. You look out at them and see two young boys standing up on the sleds. They are bundled up in warm winter gear, woolly scarves and all, and another child sits in one of the chairs on the kick sled. Her mitten-covered hands rest on her lap, and she is wearing a white knitted beanie. 
pieces of her hair dance in the wind as the group ventures further down the street. After a few more minutes of riding, you leisurely make a right-hand turn. As you come around the corner, a true winter wonderland makes itself known. You can see the lake covered in thick ice. Surrounding much of the lake are pine trees magically dusted in snow. You can already smell the aroma of fresh pine in the air. It entices your senses. It is one of your favorite wintry smells. A bit of peppermint, a dash of pine, and lots of warm spices really embody the winter season to you. The sun has almost completely set and you can see stars beginning to pop up in the dark blue sky. A few lampposts flicker on in response to the darkening day. You can hear a faint clicking sound as the lights turn on. It looks like the perfect scene for ice skating, you think to yourself. Once you are close enough, you come to a stop, letting out a little sigh after your leisurely ride down the street. You look forward and admire the snow-covered pine trees that meet the frozen lake and blissfully snowy terrain for a few more moments. A sturdy-looking log catches your eye. It's laying flat on a blanket of snow, providing a beautiful contrast with its dark brown color. You pull your sled over to the log and press it firmly into the snow. Next, you glance down at your hands. Starting with your right hand, you use your left to pull at the glove's fingertips before carefully sliding it off and slipping it into your coat pocket. You repeat the same motions with the left glove, feeling the soft, woolen knits between your fingertips. You then bend forward and unzip your bag. You push some things to the side until you are able to take out your pair of ice skates. They clink and bump against each other as you pull them out of the backpack. The blades have a protective cover on them, so you carefully pull them off of each shoe. As you do this, you feel the chill of the metal ice skates against your bare hands. You drop the covers into your bag and leave it unzipped. Currently, you are wearing snuggly snow boots. They have kept your toes and feet warm for the duration of your trip, and you're almost hesitant to take them off in this cold weather. Nonetheless, you scoot your backpack over and take a seat on the chair of the kick sled. You prop up your right foot on the log to get closer to your boot. Then you unlace your shoe 
and slide your foot out, feeling the thick fleece lining of the inside of the boot. You gently drop the boot onto the snow and then slide your foot into the ice skate. You wrap the laces around your hands and pull tightly to secure the skate onto your foot. Now you carefully tie a sturdy and tight knot and wiggle your foot to make sure the fit is perfect. You bring your right foot off the log and then quickly repeat the motions again with your left. Once both of the skates are securely on, you feel a tingling, butterfly-like sensation in your stomach. Luckily, it is finally time to take to the icy lake. Before you prop yourself up, you grab each of your gloves out of your coat pockets and place them back on your hands. You can instantly feel your skin warming up to a cozy temperature once more. Now you are ready, you decide. You stand up and take a couple of steps towards the frozen lake. The snow crunches under your skates. Before you know it, you are on the ice. Your body is moving in an almost magical way. You haven't ice skated in a while but the muscle memory kicks in. Soon, you feel like you're performing a special dance as you glide across the lake. The blades hiss and grind, creating a beautiful sound as you swirl around the thick, freezing ice. You feel so happy and carefree in this moment. It's just you and the natural beauty of Arctic Finland all around. You find yourself spinning in circles most joyously. You smile and chuckle as you look up at the sky, feeling thankful for this special life. As you do this, a large snowflake falls onto the tip of your nose. This makes you giggle even more. You feel like this day couldn't get any better. You continue to skate, allowing the sensational feeling of freedom to consume you. As you glide, you play around with different ice skating tricks, like turning around and skating backwards. It takes you a moment to get the hang of it, but once you are in the swing of things, It feels completely natural. You sway your hips back and forth, zigzagging across the lake as you skate backward. After a few minutes, you turn around, and as you do this, you can feel the crisp air surrounding you. The temperatures have dropped since the sun set. This 
makes you think about the moon. You slow down and look up at the sky again, searching for it. There it is, you whisper to yourself. It's a thin crescent moon, but it still shines brightly in the night sky. Near it, you notice Venus. You remember it's the planet because it looks like a star, but doesn't twinkle. Instead, maintaining a smooth glow. As you admire the seemingly tiny details of the constellations, you notice something peculiar. It's as though a fog is appearing in the sky. You squint to get a better look. Then, you let out a small, joyful gasp as the colors deepen into a mesmerizing bright green. You realize you are witnessing the northern lights or the aurora borealis. The green lights sway back and forth in the star-dotted sky, almost mimicking the way that you've been skating. The lights continue to shimmer. One section is a bright, almost neon green. From there, the lights extend and soften as they dance and move. But, despite the movement overhead, it feels like time has been standing still. You don't even remember if you are still skating on the ice or not. You feel like you have transcended space and time, gazing up at the beautiful sky. The otherworldly colors, the lights, and the performance itself feels so close. You reach out your hand to try and touch it. And then in a fleeting moment, the lights pulse and fade away, like curtains being drawn at the end of a performance. Your body feels tingly all over as you stand in the middle of the frozen lake. You feel so alive, yet calm and serene, after seeing the spectacle of the Aurora Borealis. You've never witnessed anything like it, you think. You are so glad to have been here on this perfect day. You slowly glide around the lake one last time as your mind focuses on the natural phenomenon you just witnessed. Then you make your way to the edge of the lake closest to your belongings. You carefully step off the frozen lake as a few tiny pieces of ice shoot up from beneath your skates. Once you're back in the snow, you sit down in the kick sled. Your fuzzy boots are waiting patiently for you. You bend down and untie each of your ice skates and pull them off one by one. 
you set them aside, slipping on your boots and lacing them up comfortably, too. Then, you stand up and turn around, brushing off any excess snow that fell on your shoulders while you skated. As you pick up your skates, you feel the weight of them in one of your hands as you dig out the protective covers for the blades with the other. You gently push the covers onto each of the blades and plop them into the bag. Letting out a contented sigh, you zip up your backpack one last time. Now, you pull your kick sled back onto the main path and prepare for the short return ride to the center of the village. Back on the kick sled, you speed along the snow covered path. Some locals and visitors are still out enjoying the evening. You notice they all have a similar, happy glow about them. You imagine yours is the same. As you sled past a group, you hear them talking about the northern lights. You smile thinking about the extra special view you experienced from the secluded lake. Soon, you arrive at your cabin and park your sled next to some others. There's no need to lock it up or secure it in any way. This is a safe and trustworthy place. There are a couple of stairs that lead up to the cabin. You softly kick the front of your boots against them, knocking off clumps of snow along the way. Once you are at the door, you scrape your feet against the snowflaked patterned doormat and turn the knob to enter. The small cabin has a main area where a few guests can gather around the fireplace. You look over at the crackling fire and spot a couple sitting close to one another, holding steaming mugs of some warm drink. The steam billows up while a woman takes a sip. As the door closes behind you, she turns your way and smiles before gazing once again at the fireplace. Heading down the hallway, you hear the creaking of the wooden floorboards beneath your feet. Soon, you reach your room. It's a cozy bedroom with a large bed and rustic decor. A small pine tree sits in the corner, sending its lovely scent into the air. You slip off your boots and flick on a string of fairy lights on the wall by your bed that creates a welcoming mood. Across from your bed is a window. You walk over and pull open the curtains, closing your eyes and making a hopeful wish. For a moment, You look out at the mounds of snow, and then up at the clear, 
star-filled sky. With a yawn, you begin to prepare yourself for bed. Soon, you're pulling back the luxuriously soft blankets and slipping yourself between layers of bed sheets, one leg at a time. You fluff your pillows and then lean across to the bedside table to flick off the fairy lights. Then, like magic, you see the northern lights through your window, glowing greens intertwine with soft whites in the sky. The lights move slowly, like they are dancing and humming along to a bedtime story. Time passes, and the lights glisten high above you. Before you know it, you can barely keep your eyes open. You blink slowly and softly as you drift into a restful slumber, dreaming about the magic of Arctic Finland and the dazzling Aurora Borealis. Once upon a time, winter fell suddenly upon an entire kingdom and never turned to spring. The freeze lasted so long that children were born and raised to adulthood, and they had never experienced a thaw. They had never seen the trees burst into bloom. They had never felt the summer sun on their faces. Of course, these children didn't know any other kind of life. They listened to their parents and grandparents telling tales of the seasons, and they couldn't quite imagine it. The pastel colors they knew were not in the flowers, but in the evening sky. The only verdant shade they understood was the eternal color of the evergreen tree. And of course, most of nature was simply white. As much as their elders tried to conjure visions of rolling, lush hills, sunny wildflowers, and crystal blue rivers, they could only imagine it. The question of why this eternal winter had begun was never truly answered. However, one thing was certain. At the same time that the winter had settled in, a formidable, icy mountain had appeared in the center of the kingdom. It was so slippery and unapproachable 
that it became known as the Glass Mountain. Rumor had it that the ominous peak was the work of a sorcerer who, after squabbling with a king, cursed the man and his daughter to be marooned atop it forever. Many a fireside tale had been told of men who had tried to scale the mountain, carrying a gift to win the hand of the stranded princess. Alas, it was nearly impossible to sum it, and, according to the stories, was jealously guarded by an enormous, fearsome bird. Every suitor who had attempted the quest had failed, ending up back at the bottom of the slope. Even those who had the sense to use an axe or an ice pick as leverage eventually had to let go of their tool in order to battle the monstrous bird. To ascend the mountain and outlast the bird's advances seemed impossible. From brave knights to humble local farmers, it seemed that no one could conquer the glass obstacle and reach the princess. There was a very young man named Jamie who lived in the village by the foot of the mountain. He had grown up in the shadow of the enormous monument of ice, hearing the stories and seeing one hopeful adventurer after another meet with failure. Like all the others his age, he had never known any season but winter. Although he found stories of the summer intriguing, he didn't know why he should yearn for it. However, Jamie did love a challenge. He was a very clever boy. He had a great many chores to complete each day in order to help his parents make ends meet. However, in his free time, he enjoyed skating on the village pond, where he would make graceful circles, gazing up at the sparkling mountain. As he came of age, he dreamed of being the one man who could reach the princess and woo her. While there were certainly many nice girls in the village who would have gladly been his sweetheart, he wished to know what lay beyond his small hamlet. He did not want to live a life without experiencing adventure. Jamie thought and thought about how he might get to the top of that glistening peak, and he hatched a plan that was almost ridiculously simple. At dinner one night, sitting at the wooden table by his family's hearth, he told his parents what he was going to do. He planned to use his ice skates to anchor his feet while he scaled the mountain. That way, when the fabled giant bird appeared, he would have his hands free to ward it off. His mother was fretful, fearing Jamie would injure himself with this mad scheme. His father was equally skeptical. How could Jamie succeed where so many more worldly and experienced men had failed? Hoping to dissuade him, his parents pressed him with questions. 
how would he battle the large bird with his hands? What gift could he possibly take for the princess? Jamie had to admit that he didn't have the answers to those questions, but he could not be swayed. He was determined to attempt the climb the next day. Jamie's mother whispered her concerns to the neighbor. Then the neighbor, in hushed tones, told her daughter. The daughter told the boy across the street. The news traveled throughout the village like lightning. So it was that by the time Jamie had readied himself to approach the mountain, the entire town was out to watch the spectacle. Taking a rucksack with a loaf of bread and a bottle of water, he tied his skates together and draped them over his shoulder. Then, ignoring the stares of the villagers, he put his head down and walked resolutely towards the mysterious peak of ice. He would not be deterred by their doubts. As he trudged down the path that led to the bottom of the mountain, he breathed deeply, steadying himself. Ignoring the pack of curious neighbors who had followed behind him, he went over his plan. In short, it was simple. He would use his ice skates to scale the berg. When the bird came, he would somehow shelter himself with his hands or smack it away. Hopefully, his lack of a gift would not keep him from entering the castle and meeting the princess when he arrived. That was the entire strategy. He had prepared nothing else. The woods lay silently around him, glistening with an ever-present blanket of sparkling snow. As he walked, each step made a sound that seemed unusually loud in the stillness. Thud, crunch, thud, crunch, his boots said to the void. The rhythm calmed him, and he sank into a meditative state. And then, he was there. Abruptly, a sheer wall of glistening ice rose steeply before him, without any visible handhold or foothold to be found. Jamie was aware the villagers were watching from the forest. He dropped his skates from his shoulders and removed his rucksack. Then, sitting on a large rock, he removed his boots, donning the skates in their place. He put his boots in his rucksack, for he imagined he'd need them when he reached the top. Then he turned and faced his greatest obstacle head on. Putting the rucksack securely on his back, he took a tentative step, lodging the pick of his skate blade into the ice. Then, stepping up, he placed the other skate blade slightly above it. The hill was steep, but the incline was just enough that he could lean forward, balancing himself on the slippery surface 
with his hands. Continuing slowly with one foot above the other, he began the climb. Jamie didn't allow himself to think about how much time was passing or how much energy he had left. Pick, step, hoist. Pick, step, hoist. He willed himself into the slow pattern of the ascent, looking neither right nor left, and certainly not up or down. The gaggle of villagers soon faded into the background of his consciousness. As his climbing continued, he became vaguely aware that he was moving out of the shadow at the bottom of the hill. He was reaching a height at which the chilly rays of the winter sun lit the ice in his path. And what a sight it was. Simultaneously translucent and impenetrable, the mountain seemed to contain infinite mirrors that reflected the light from outside. Unlike an ordinary mountain, this one glittered as if it had been made of faceted crystal. As he rose farther and farther upward, the sunshine the mountain was reflecting became almost blinding in its power. It refracted again and again inside the icy slope, casting its brilliant rays outward and into his line of vision. Rather than making the air feel warmer, however, the brilliance was accompanied by an increasing chill. In fact, Jamie felt that he had never been so cold. An icy breeze seemed to blow constantly around his head and shoulders, creating an incessant whistling that droned on in his ears. He didn't know how much time had passed, but Jamie's reverie was eventually broken by another sound. A distant bird call floated on top of the wind. First, it seemed far away, and then it began to feel closer. Turning his face upward, he tried to spot the source of the noise. He knew it must be the infamous bird he had been expecting. At first, all he could see was the dazzling sunlight. Then, From nowhere, a pair of unnaturally large wings blotted out the sun. This would have been a relief to him, except that he knew the bird was coming straight at him. And then it was upon him. In a flurry of wintry white feathers, the massive beast was beating its wings about his head. Digging his skates more securely into the mountain, he instinctively protected himself, ducking under his hands. He tried reaching out to swat the bird, but it already had him at a disadvantage. He knew if he didn't think of something soon, he would lose his balance and slide back down the mountain, like every other adventurer before him. 
turning his face boldly upward, he spied the feet of the bird hovering above him. Without thinking, he flung both hands upwards and gripped its black legs tightly, one in each hand. The animal shrieked with indignation. Then it began to rise. It flapped its powerful wings, sending a light shower of frost scudding across the mountainside and over Jamie's face. Jamie hung on for dear life, and the bird began to fly upward, dislodging his skates from the ice. He was ascending, going up, 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 and then he was aloft. As if attempting to escape the tiresome burden at his feet, the white eagle threw all its energy into the flight, carrying Jamie far into the sky and lifting him upward to the top of the icy mountain. At first, his eyes were screwed tightly shut. After a few moments, however, he tentatively opened them and looked downward. To his amazement, the glistening ice sped by him. He was moving faster than he ever had before. To his side, he could see beyond the mountain and to the snowbound landscape below miniature houses, miniature trees, and tiny winding roads created a storybook world that seemed unreal. The view was a true marvel, but his skates were heavy, and Jamie began to feel that his arms would not be able to hold much longer the bird had stopped ascending. In fact, they were now at the top of the mountain, speeding across a flat expanse of ice. But just when he knew he couldn't last another minute, he saw a single, shining golden tree appear ahead of them. It was standing all alone in a world of frosty white, sending brilliant golden light in every direction. Alive with an appearance of warmth, its many small leaves seemed to subtly move, as if the trees were the only living thing around. Jamie wasn't sure this landing would be soft enough, but it was his only chance. As the bird swooped over the tree, he let go. He landed hard and was surrounded by a musical vibration that sounded like a thousand chimes. It took a moment for him to recover his wits, but when he did, he cautiously sat up. Looking around him, he realized he was inside the largest bird's nest he had ever seen. As he took in the golden canopy around and above him, he saw that the center of the nest contained a massive, glittering egg. Brilliantly gold in the sun, the egg was big enough to fill his entire rucksack. 
examining it further, he saw that it was rooted to the nest by a layer of ice and frost. It seemed to have been there for a long time. Crawling gingerly closer to the egg, Jamie ran his hand over it. Pushing it lightly, he saw that it was frozen in place. He would not be able to dislodge it without risking a fracture. However, he wanted this egg. It was the one thing he had found that might serve as a gift to the princess. Sitting back on his heels, he thought hard. Then he had an idea. He reached back into his rucksack and pulled his bottle of water from the warm place inside. Uncapping it, he slowly poured the lukewarm water over the egg. As he had hoped, it was just warm enough to melt the frost and ice on the egg. Slowly but surely, the icy coating contracted and disappeared, and the golden shell of the egg emerged. As soon as he felt he could move it, Jamie gently rocked his hand against his newfound treasure. With only slight resistance, it detached from its place in the nest and was free. Unfortunately, Jamie had not seen the last of the wintry white eagle. Crying with indignation, it returned to the tree, swooping down out of nowhere. Jamie could see that it was bent on keeping the egg from leaving the nest. Looking quickly around him, Jamie grabbed the only item he could think to use. As the eagle's feet descended once more towards his head, he pushed the loaf of bread from his rucksack into the bird's clutches. Thinking it had seized its prey, the bird squawked triumphantly and sailed away into the sky. Its cries receded into the distance. Jamie sat still for a moment, breathing a sigh of relief. When he was sure the eagle was gone, he turned back to the egg. Removing his boots from his rucksack, he gently nestled the egg inside, securely closing the flap. Then he removed his skates and put his boots on, once again draping the skates over his shoulder. Leaving his rucksack at his feet, he carefully stood up in the enormous nest, hoping to survey the top of the mountain. At first, all he saw was a vast expanse of shining whiteness. The frosty summit appeared barren, brilliantly reflecting the rays of the sun back from the ground in an unending vista of ice. Shielding his eyes with his hand, however, he thought he saw a bright twinkle in the distance. Holding his breath, he waited. Then he saw it flash again. Something else was out there. 
whether or not it was the castle he sought. It was the only other object on top of the peak. He resolved to walk to it and find out more. With the precious egg resting heavily on his back, he slowly descended through the branches of the golden tree and shimmied down to the ground. Then, hoisting the rucksack up on his shoulders, he began to walk in the direction of the mysterious flash. Time lost all meaning to Jamie as he made his way across the frozen expanse. The frigid temperatures turned his nose and fingers numb, and his eyes were wearied by the unrelenting brightness. The sun did appear to be moving through the sky, lying lower on the horizon than it had during his morning ascent. He judged that it must be mid-afternoon, and he hoped very much that he would reach the flashing object before nightfall. There was no shelter for him otherwise. He made progress across the ice sheet without any further sightings of the White Eagle. As he drew closer to his destination, the softening light of the late afternoon revealed a structure that appeared larger the closer he got. It was not long before he was quite sure that he had found the castle from the village stories. And what a palace of ice it was. As if sculpted directly from nature, its towers and turrets plunged skyward in a mass of glittering shapes. Impossibly tall and delicate, it was a fortress of light reflecting all the colors in the sky. As sunset approached, it was a mirror of orange, pink, and gold. He reached the front of the castle and paused before the drawbridge, which had been frozen in place, lowered across the moat. The moat, too, was now a river of ice, snaking smoothly around the fortress. Carefully picking his way across the bridge, he paused before an enormous pair of doors, knowing he had reached the point in his quest where he had no idea what to do next. He did the only thing he could think of. He knocked. The knock echoed inside the glass castle, as if it was the first knock ever heard. He could detect the sound shuddering through the interior. It sounded both infinite and brittle. He waited for what seemed like an interminable amount of time. Then, slowly, the door began to open. Shivering with the effort, as if it had forgotten its purpose, the portal opened. At the bottom of this very tall door, Pushing with all her might was a young lady. She was wearing a plain white dress and a heavy cloak. 
Atop that, she had a fuzzy blue muffler and an extremely improbable, if practical, set of woolly earmuffs. Peering with amazement at Jamie, she opened her mouth as if to speak, and then seemed to think better of it. Then she took a deep breath, and, very assertively, asked him who he was exactly. Jamie did not know what he had been expecting, but a direct interrogation by the princess was certainly not it. He haltingly answered that he was from the village down the mountain, and that, if she was amenable, he would like to rescue her. Having said it, he felt a little silly. The princess looked back at him dubiously. He became uncomfortably aware that he did not appear very heroic, carrying a pair of skates and a rucksack and nothing else. Then his face lit up, and he said, I brought you something special I found. May I bring it inside? This obviously piqued her interest, and she nodded. Stepping aside with a guarded expression, she motioned to the interior hall. Jamie entered. It felt as cold inside as out. He could understand why the princess was partial to earmuffs. Before he could present her with his gift, she straightened up and introduced herself. I'm Leona, she said. He made an awkward bow, offering his own name. She nodded graciously in return. So then, Jamie, what have you brought me? Jamie pulled the rucksack off his shoulder and opened the top of it, slowly drawing the glittering golden egg from its hiding place. Leona's eyes grew wide at the sight of it, and she gently took it from his hands. As she turned it this way and that in the dim light of the hall, he explained to her how he had come by it. Upon hearing the entire story, she said, that she had seen the white eagle often flying around the mountain, and that she suspected it was the animal form of the sorcerer who had once cursed them. She related, sadly, that her father had long ago left the castle in search of the man, hoping to convince him to release them. Alas, he had never returned. And so, she had been here, not knowing how much time passed, never aging all these years. Jamie expressed his regret for her unfortunate situation. But Leona appeared to be distracted by the egg in her hands. Shifting it from palm to palm, she said, Jamie, the egg is getting warmer. As he watched, the egg began to look luminous, as if lit from within. 
The shell, which had been a static canvas of gold, appeared to be shifting and moving. Unsure of what to do, Leona set the egg in the center of the flagstones and stepped away from it. As they watched, the egg grew brighter, and the hall was suffused with a golden light. Leona pulled off her muffler, exclaiming that she felt rather warm, and Jamie realized he was feeling quite hot as well. Instinctively stepping back farther from the egg, they realized that the hall had begun to drip water all around them. The babble of running water began to fill their ears. It was melting. Without discussion, they pushed the doors of the castle open and rushed outside across the moat. Turning to look at the castle, they saw an incredible transformation taking place. The structure was melting from the center outward, and a bright light was shooting up into the twilight like a geyser of fire. With a low rumble, the center caved in, splashing water into the frozen moat. To their great amazement, a fiery orange and red bird soared upward and paused, flapping its wings over the remains of the ice castle. With each downward motion, It sent rivers of warm water outward, thawing everything inside the moat and flooding the area around it. Jamie could see that they had to get off the mountain as soon as possible. As the great phoenix swooped and called out over their heads, he decided to take a risk. Dropping his heavy skates on the ground, he told Leona to hold tight to him. She complied, linking her arms around his neck. Then, as the beautiful bird swooped close above their heads, he grabbed it by the feet holding on as tightly as he had done to the frosty white eagle on the way up the mountain. Without protest, the bird carried them into the air. The fragile ice palace vanished behind them, and the ground melted away and caved in as the triumphant phoenix soared across the mountain top and plunged downward, heading straight for the village below. The slippery mountainside sped by, dripping rivulets of water downhill. The wind in their faces was powerful and filled with heat. They closed their eyes tightly, willing themselves simply not to let go. Then, in an instant, their feet were brushing the ground, and they released the bird, falling in a heap in the clearing at the foot of the mountain. The bird surged upward, a fantastic glowing orb in the night sky, 
and vanished into the distance with a cry. A shower of sparks dispersed in its wake, drifting to the ground like a meteor shower. Jamie and Leona lay in the wet snow, facing upward, as they tried to catch their breath. Then, after a few incredulous moments, they turned their faces to each other and laughed. They had done it. Leona was free, and Jamie was home. The villagers had long ago given up on watching his climb, and had gone home to their halves and their warm dinners. Nobody was there to see him trudging homeward in the moonlight, with an unfamiliar young lady on his arm. It was a great surprise to his parents, therefore, when their son made a miraculous reappearance on their doorstep. His mother was so beside herself that she spilled the stew. By the time everyone had awakened the next morning, the world had transformed. A warm, steady rain was showering the entire land, and the snow and ice had almost completely melted. It was a whole day before the water stopped coming, and the sun came out. When the first warm rays of spring were felt, After so many years, the village rejoiced. As the weeks and months went on, children came to know the seasons. They finally understood the green color of the grass and the many colorful shades of spring, summer, and autumn. Small, cheerful birds sang their happy melodies from every treetop. Prosperity returned to the village. And when Jamie asked Leona, the winter princess, to marry him, he was able to give her a beautiful bouquet of flowers in every color of the rainbow. You are on dry soil, carpeted with fallen pine needles that snap gently under your weight. You watch your breath bloom out of you, quickly becoming a cloud of condensation as it hits the cold air. But even as it hangs, you notice that your body feels warm and dry. You are wearing a thick but light coat that protects you from the winter air pressing coolly against your cheek. You take a moment to appreciate the invigorating feeling of the cold air 
in your nose and mouth. It is exquisitely fresh. With every breath, you can almost taste the clear glacial water and snow. The milky light of a full moon falls in gentle shafts around you as it is filtered through the tall, slender trees above. Then, as your eyes adjust, you notice it dance and shimmer on the snow that weighs down waxy branches of pine. As soon as you notice this, you detect the unmistakable scent of pine trees. Sharp, astringent, and woody, it fills your nose and grounds your senses in this forest. A wave of gratitude washes over you. How wonderful it is to be in nature on a night like this one. You raise your head to look up above you. The pines rise elegantly towards the crystal clear sky. Through the silhouette of the branches, you glimpse a magnificent spatter of stars. They shine like white, pale purple, and green jewels sewn onto deep blue velvet. But they are vastly outshined by the pearly orb of the full moon. You give yourself a moment to take in this beautiful sight feeling the tingle of amazement that runs through your body as you look into the vast unknown of our universe. How lucky you are to witness it. When you have taken in all you can, you slowly bring your gaze back down to earth. As the trees enter your line of sight, you notice small, soft yellow lights in the distance. They are half obscured by the trees around you, so you move forwards to get a better look. As you brush away a low pine branch, you realize they belong to two strings of lights that line either side of a footpath. Each light is about the size of an egg, and they are spaced evenly every few meters along a thick green cable. You notice how they softly illuminate the pine needles around them and the rough, knobbly bark of the trees. You feel a sense of ease wash over you. You understand that the natural thing to do is follow these guiding lights. So, without any hurry, you begin to tread the path The dry earth feels compact and solid beneath you, and the more you move along it, the greater a sense of peace and stability engulfs you. You gradually become aware of the stillness in the forest. The forest is quiet and peaceful, except for the sound you make as you move along the path. 
but at the same time, you can sense something magical in the air. You take your deepest breath yet, and it floods you with a sense of well-being. Then, slowly and intuitively, you turn your head and see a magnificent sight. A few meters away, among the tree trunks, stands a deer. She is a doe, and the moonlight glistens on her smooth, caramel-colored hide. Your eyes find hers. They are deep, dark, and warm. You can see the lights from the path reflected in them. You hold the connection between you, at the same time becoming aware that you have stopped moving. It's as if this gentle creature can see into your heart. You feel your chest expanding with warmth, as though your heart is aglow. Her breath is quicker and lighter than your own. She is inviting you to look inside yourself. You trust her, so you allow yourself to give in to the warm, tingling feeling that is collecting in your heart. As you stand, connecting with the beautiful doe, you experience happy and easy memories. Your heart is showing you the places and the people that you love. You can feel them filling you up with gratitude and joy. Your breath is steady and nourishing, naturally flowing deep into your lungs. Calmly, you turn your feelings to the dough. It's as if you can extend some of your heart's glow to her. You thank the doe for her presence, and in return, she slowly blinks. Then she gracefully turns and canters lightly into the forest. As you listen to the sound of her footsteps fade away, you return your attention to the forest and this curious path. You continue along it, your own movements lighter and softer than before. The path begins to curve gracefully to the left. You keep following it, trusting the little warm lights and watching your clouds of breath. Soon, the trees start to thin. More and more snow litters the ground. You watch its surface sparkle in the moonlight. The trees are becoming shorter now, and you can see something beyond them. Your pace quickens slightly. Then, a beautiful view erupts beyond the trees. A still and silent lake. 
you reach the edge of the forest and look out onto the lake. It is dark and glossy. The full moon is reflected perfectly in its waters. You realize that the path has opened up onto a small beach. The shore is covered with smooth grey pebbles that peek through the blanket of snow on the ground. The warm lights that you have followed line the edge of the beach. They hang from the branches of the trees. You take in this amazing sight. All around the lake, you can see the white and sparkling pine trees frosted with snow. These two are reflected as mirror images in the lake. You let a small sigh escape you. Then you notice the sweet smell of wood smoke warm and inviting. You breathe it in, letting it fill you with nostalgia. You turn towards the smell and see what looks like a cozy wooden cabin at the end of the beach. Its one window glows orange and warm. A tiny tin chimney sends out puffs of soft grey wood smoke into the night air, and a narrow jetty runs from its door to the water. Without hesitation, you head for the cabin. You feel the fresh snow crunching beneath you. As you reach the quaint structure, you notice an unusual warmth in the air. Opening the cabin door, you see what looks like steam coil out of it. Like your breath in the cool air, it hangs misty and pale. You step past the threshold and into a small changing room. The walls, floors, ceiling and benches are made entirely of light wooden panels. The soft but inviting smell of tree sap floods your nostrils. You breathe it in deeply and understand that you have just found a Scandinavian sauna. At the same time, you are aware of the same warmth here. You notice the cool skin on your face tingle in it. You peel away your coat and hang it on a wooden hook. Then your eyes rest on the white, fluffy towels that lay neatly stacked on the bench. You reach out to touch one. It is soft, dry, and inviting. You ready yourself for the sauna by wrapping the towel around you. Just then, you see another door in the changing room. It's made of wood too, but with a large, tinted glass window. Beyond it, you can see the sauna, empty and ready for you. 
lit softly with the warm orange glow of a fire. Gratefully, you open the door and enter the sauna. The fantastically warm air welcomes you. You choose a spot on the smooth wooden benches, feeling the wood against your skin. Your eyes rest on the log burner, black but pristine, with a glass window lending a view into the crackling fire inside. The flames dance and flutter, casting a glowing, flickering light. You relax your body into your seat on the bench, and feel a deep sense of calm spread over you. Your body is becoming warmer and warmer. The muscles in your neck and shoulders are lengthening and releasing. This fantastic sensation creeps through your whole body. You notice the long muscles of your arms and legs soften. It's as though each and every part of you is relaxing deeply in this heat. All the day-to-day tension that is held there is disappearing. You take a deep breath in to support your body as it releases the stress it does not need. Then, the tiny muscles in your jaw follow. Then your back. Each vertebra seems to sigh with relief. Finally, you feel your shoulder blades slacken, releasing what feels like years of tension and strain. Your whole body is surrendering to this heat. It occurs to you that this is your time to release anything you no longer wish to carry around. Your heart is still open, still glowing from your encounter with the dough. You use it now to see what you could do without. In this exquisitely relaxing place, you allow the old tensions, stresses, thoughts and feelings to simply melt away. As they melt, you feel yourself becoming lighter and more spacious inside. Your breath becomes deeper, slower, and more sustaining. As a result, a profound sense of well-being spreads through you. You are so wonderfully relaxed. But you know your time in the sauna is coming to an end. You get up and move tranquilly towards the door. You open it and make your way back into the changing room, noticing a thick white dressing gown and extra towel hanging up for you. You take them off the hook and open the door to the outside. 
the cold winter air hits your warm body. It feels refreshing and revitalizing. Then your eyes find the jetty and the smooth, dark lake beyond. Intuitively, you know what to do. You move purposefully and barefoot along the jetty. The cold of the wood feels wonderful against your hot feet. You reach the end and find a ladder like those in a swimming pool. It extends from the jetty down into the lake. You leave your towel and climb down the ladder. As your feet touch the icy water, shivers run up your legs. You can feel your arm hairs standing on end. But you keep climbing down. When the water moves up to your thighs, you let go and allow yourself to drop into this natural plunge pool. The cold water takes your breath away, but at the same time, it invigorates your body. You have never felt so cleansed and refreshed. You can feel every inch of your body alive and well. Your heart is beating with life. A sense of immense gratitude tingles through you, as if you can feel the moonlight shining from within. The water is not deep. You marvel at your own body's movements as you pull yourself back up the ladder. Finally, you reach the jetty and slip on the bathrobe. You wrap your head in the towel. They feel so warm and comforting against your skin. Then you make your way back to the sauna, aware of the cold water dripping from your body and onto the jetty's dark wood. But this time, you open the door and find not a changing room, but a bedroom. Without a shadow of a question, you step inside. The room is candle-lit, The pale wooden floors and walls glow warmly. In its center is a broad, squashy bed. There is a faint scent of herbs in the air, relaxing and soothing. You pad towards the bed feeling your body getting ready to welcome sleep. The bedroom is the perfect temperature, not too cool, not too warm. The bed sheets are crisp and clean. Night clothes have been laid out for you, You pull them on, and their light cotton feels soothing against your skin. Then 
you climb into bed and lay yourself down. Your body sinks gratefully into the mattress, and you let out a sigh of thanks. The pillows support your head perfectly. As you lie in this bed, relaxed and happy, you notice how good you feel. You know how rejuvenating and calming the sauna has been for you. Then, your awareness comes to rest on your heart center, still warm and full of that glowing feeling. You take a moment to sink into it. This is the space inside you that has been made to enjoy life. Everything that lights you up can be found here, from your hobbies and interests to your loved ones and dreams. You notice how much more space there seems to be for your heart after the sauna. You take a smooth, flowing breath in and feel deeply content. Your eyelids are heavy and slowly they close. Your breathing becomes even. Your mind softens, and gently you drift into a long and beautiful sleep that nourishes every part of your being. It was Samhain evening many years ago, before humans started counting the years as they do now. But they knew Samhain, the night when the season of plenty ended and winter truly began. The land was cool and still, as if holding its breath in expectation. Hidden on the peak of Ben Nevis, the tallest mountain in what would one day be called the British Isles, a stone formation was painted with the final light of the setting sun. Ben Nevis stood above the Grampian Mountains snow-capped for most of the year and fiercely watching over the highlands. The fiery orange glow of sunset cast a combination of light and shadow that could make a watcher believe the stone was the face of an ancient woman, lined with the cares of the world, but peacefully asleep. As the last sliver of the sun dipped below the horizon, the stone woman opened her eye. The afterglow sky revealed the giantess 
moving her long fingers and wiggling her huge toes. A cool wind blew, and the sound of her waking movements was like that of an avalanche. She moved slowly and carefully, relishing in movement after so many months of stillness. Her skin, just minutes ago rock, was now a deep sapphire blue. Her hair, which could have been mistaken for snow, was revealed to be white, wild, and long. She wore grey robes and had a grey cloth tied across her face as an eye patch, for she sacrificed the eye to create the moon long ago. Her face was stern, but not unkind. It was a face that had witnessed the lands rising from the ocean, and the first apes discovering fire. The old giantess had many names. The Storm Hag, the Queen of Winter, the Crone, just to name a few. But her daughter knew her as Mother Beira. She was fully awake now, her limbs warm and movable again, with no trace of stoniness about them. Her first thought was of her daughter, but she would have to wait for the sweet moment of reunion. There was work to do. Beira collected her tools from a hidden crag in the mountain. She first pulled out her staff, made from a gigantic Scots pine. It would bring the frost of winter and freeze the ground with each step she took. The next item to emerge from the crag was a basket woven from young sapling trees. In it, Beira carried a huge hammer. It had an oak log for a handle and the hardest iron for the head. Finally, she pulled out a great grey plaid dirty from months of sitting in the crag. Her tools collected, Beira turned her head and made her way west. She arrived in very little time, for Beira was a giantess and could cross all of what would one day be Scotland in a few long strides. On the west coast, she came to a part of the sea dominated by the Corryvreckan whirlpool. She lowered her huge body into the sea, not at all bothered by the freezing temperature. Beira got to work washing her great plant in the whirlpool. Her hands dunked and rubbed the cloth in the churning water, and she hummed gently to herself, a song that the wind taught her. The whirlpool was her cauldron, her wash tub and her source of magic. For three days, 
she washed without pause, bringing about rough waves and fierce storms. The storms traveled across the land, bringing rain, sleet, and winds. The animals and men knew that this was their first sign that winter had truly arrived. Hibernating animals found their dens, and humans prepared their fields for frost. At the end of the third day, Beira finally took her plant from the whirlpool, having cleaned it again to the purest white. She shook it out to its full size, and draped it lovingly across the land. As she did so, it became a blanket of pure snow that covered all. Beira spent the following weeks tending to her herd of red deer. This was no ordinary herd of deer. The animals were large, and the herd counted in the hundreds, each one with a vibrant coat, and every male with a large set of antlers. They would only respond to Beira, and no hunter ever sought to strike one down. Beira led them to secret patches of greenery to feed, and hidden, unfrozen rivers to drink. As she drove her massive herd before her, they created deep trails in the land. In this way, she created valleys and dells, She widened rivers, and her herd's hooves churned the earth for fertile fields. They ate any remaining green vegetation, and thus cleared the land for new growth in the spring. When she was not tending to the deer, Beira took her hammer and set about carving the land. She created mountains as her stepping stones, so she could more easily travel. Beira made hills to sit upon, and see as far as she liked. Her busy hammer took the land that was flat and plain, and transformed it into one that was varied and beautiful. While Beira shaped the land, she thought of how the next year when she woke from her own hibernation, there would be a host of new plants and vegetation littered across it. It was not her responsibility to create new life. That was the job of spring and her daughter's realm. She was winter, and her tasks were to shape the land while it was resting and asleep, to make the snow that would melt to water the land come warmer weather and to keep the cycle of the year balanced with a period of restful stagnation. But this carving and herding was not easy work. Beira was a very old woman, and she needed rest. One day, 
she was minding a new well she created near Hollow Mountain. It was deep into winter, and she had been laboring tirelessly for months. She spied the large impression in the mountain that gave it its name, and thought that it looked like the perfect spot for her to sit and rest while she waited for the well to fill. The crisp winter sun warmed her azure face, and her huge eyelid began to droop. In a few minutes, the mountain was shaking with the sound of her snores. All the while, the water in the well climbed and climbed. It overflowed and ran to a valley below the mountain. The valley was filled with water by the time Beira awoke and stopped the flowing water. In an attempt to drain some of the water, Beira carved a river from the newly formed lock to the ocean. She told some salmon about the beauty of her new lock and hollow mountain, convincing them to swim up the river and view her handiwork, which they continued to do every year. Before she knew it, winter was more than halfway finished. The morning of Imbolc, the last holiday of winter, was close at hand. Beira needed to decide what kind of weather she wanted that morning. It was her last day to collect firewood for the end of winter. If she wanted a long winter, she would need a bright, sunny day, so she could see well and collect a mountain of firewood. If she wanted a short winter, she would bring forth clouds and rain, and only collect a little firewood. Beira considered her options. Every year, she had this debate with herself. She loved winter, the crisp flavor of the air, the serene silence of the land, the otherworldly beauty of snow. Some years, this love of winter won out, and she brought forth the sun to collect a forest worth of firewood. On the other hand, she was very tired and very old. Her ancient bones, made from the roots of mountains, begged her for rest. She thought longingly of her throne on Ben Nevis, and the long sleep she had there. A swift end of winter also brought forth the first day of spring, the day she looked forward to every year. Beira made up her mind. She brought one blue hand to the sky and made huge circles in the air. From the circle bloomed heavy white and grey clouds. They were fluffy and thick, like the softest fleece. She spread them out along the sky, 
bringing them so low that they crowned every mountain and skimmed the top of trees. The sun started to rise, but its light was blocked thoroughly by the thick wall of clouds. Instead of sharp golden rays highlighting the land, the inky night faded gradually to a periwinkle dawn. As the morning faded into day, Beira brought the rains from her shadowy clouds. It started as a sprinkling, a light mist in the morning that cast the world in a hazy cloak. By midday, she had gathered her firewood and taken shelter beneath a great oak forest with the herd of deer. She reached into the clouds and opened the faucet of her magic. Rain poured out of the sky in a deluge. Creeks swelled, locks climbed up their banks, and rivers began to roar. The water washed away any debris from winter and seeped deep into the soil, whispering gently to seeds buried there that it was nearly time. White snowdrop flowers appeared beneath the shelter of great trees in the coming weeks. They were joined not long after by daffodil shoots growing in bright green clumps like long grass. Their white and yellow heads burst forth and turned to the sun, which was getting brighter and stronger with each passing day. Beira's great white plaid was becoming dirty in spots again as the snow melted. Birds were building nests and holding concerts in the forest at all hours of the day. Spring was coming. Beira saw that her herd of red deer came through the winter months, healthy and content. She would release them for the summer, allowing them to grow fat in the green grasslands, and bear yet more fawns before the weather turned cold again. She moved her attention to her final tasks of the year, Beira made sure that there was a plentiful level of snow on the mountain, knowing that the snowmelt would water the lowlands for the following season. She whipped up windstorms to spread dormant seeds around the land, making sure that they landed in the perfect spot to be germinated come spring. Finally, Beltana Dawn arrived, swift and sweet. Beltana was the first day of spring, the day when Beira must relinquish her grasp upon the world and return to her six-month sleep. It announced the beginning of warmth, growth, and plenty in the world. Despite these facts, 
it was also her favorite day of the year, because it was the one day she spent in the company of her daughter, the goddess of spring. As the purple night gave way to lavender day, Beira prepared herself for the meeting. She tamed her wild, wind-swept hair, straightened her stone-gray robes, and allowed a joyful smile to break over her face. As the sun raised its sleepy head over the horizon in the east, so did Brickhead in a secret meadow of grasses. Her golden red hair draped across her face as she yawned, and wildflowers burst into bloom at her waking. Her eyes were startlingly green, and a host of freckles danced across her face. Brickhead's hair was the color of spun copper, and nearly as wild as her mother's. All through it ran flowers and vines. Her simple dress was pale linen, marked with grass stains and fresh earth. She stretched and looked around to find her mother watching her from a nearby hill. Brighead's face split into a joyful grin. Where her mother was ancient, Brighead was perpetually youthful. She ran and skipped across the field and flung herself into Beira's waiting arms. The cold, harsh face of the Queen of Winter seemed to melt into one of softness and love in the presence of Spring herself. They rose hand in hand and made their way across the land. The sun, fully up, shone with a brightness that was only eclipsed by the happiness of mother and daughter. Through the low grasslands they walked. During winter, every step that Beira took with her great staff froze the ground and spread frost underfoot. Now, every step that Brighead took brought forth a bloom of flowers, grass, and soft moss. She held her mother's arm so that Beira would not need to use her staff. The grasslands went from being barren ground with a few brown stalks to being crowded with grasses wildflowers, and shrubbery. A host of pollinators, drawn by the new growth, buzzed and chirped happily in the wake of the walking pair. Brighead paused for a moment and picked up a tiny dormouse, which cleaned itself contentedly in her hand. She gave the little creature to her mother and smiled as Beira watched the dormouse scurry across her huge blue hand. 
they continued on from the grasslands to the forest. Beira spent all winter in the company of evergreen pines and firs. With the entrance of Brighead into the forest, the leafless oaks, birches, and willows sprouted new green leaves. Brighead admired the way Beira and her herd of deer had stripped back the forest over the winter, leaving enough room for her to encourage new growth. Nettles, ferns, and dock leaves raced for the best spots on the forest floor. The soft carpet of fallen pine needles and moss provided a comforting floor for their trek. Birds twittered from every branch, singing the full performance that they had been merely practicing when Beira walked these woods alone. Beira and Brighead picked early wild strawberries and carried them in Beira's basket. They enjoyed the first sweet and sour bursts of flavor under the boughs of the sun-dappled forest. Beira relayed stories of mischief that her deer got up to while Brighead slept. Her tinkling laughter was even more lovely than the bird song. They continued their journey to the big locks of the highlands. Brighead admired the new lock Beira had made that year in the shadow of Hollow Mountain. Brighead blessed the new source of fresh water with a host of fish, frogs, insects, and water birds. Large roe deer came down the opposite shore to drink its clear water. The sun was very high now, shining down on the full majesty of Hollow Mountain. Brighead's lovely laughter burst forth again when she heard just how the lock came to be. She lovingly chided her mother for working too hard. Long past were the days when Beira chased her small daughter across the newly formed land and did the telling off. Now, Beira smiled at her daughter's tone and promised to take a very long rest. Together, they climbed up Ben Nevis to the tucked away spot where Beira's mountain throne lay waiting. Brighead helped her mother into her seat and placed her tools back into the crag on the mountainside. She clucked her tongue at Beira's great plant, once again brown and grey with dirt. Brighead then sat near the foot of Beira's throne and rested her head on her mother's knee. Their journey had taken most of the day, and now the sun was dipping low in the western sky. 
Beira closed her eyes for a moment, feeling the combined warmth of the sun on her face and her daughter's head on her knee. She worked as hard as she could for the continued health of the land she loved and helped create all winter. Her payment was this one day when winter and spring were together. She loved witnessing her daughter waking up again after a winter of hibernation. She reminded Beira of when she was just a little child goddess waking from a nap. Beira always felt safe leaning on the arm of her daughter as they took their walk through the world, sharing stories and observing the beginnings of spring. Finally, after all her hard work, it was time for Beira to rest. The sun touched the horizon, shooting out rays of orange, pink, and gold across the cloudless sky. Deep purples and blues were invading from the east, and Beira felt her eyelid begin to droop. As she succumbed to her annual rest, she felt Brighead lay a sweet kiss on her cheek and whisper a wish of good dreams. Beira drifted into slumber, waiting to wake again when summer closed. Brighead watched as the sun slipped below the horizon, and her mother turned once again into stone. You find yourself tucked up in bed in a very cozy guest room. You are on the tenth floor of an old apartment building in New York City's Upper West Side. An old friend has generously offered to host you as you take in some of the sights. You're not just here as a tourist, however. You're also working on a personal research project that will require a visit to the main branch of the New York Public Library. Your research appointment at the famous Stephen A. Schwartzman building is tomorrow, and you are excited to see the resources you've been permitted to view. While browsing the library website, you were quite astounded by what you learned about this very famous main branch of the State Library. For example, it doesn't just house books. 
among more than 15 million items at this flagship location, there are many priceless objects. The library owns a copy of the Gutenberg Bible, as well as original documents once authored and distributed by the Founding Fathers of the United States. And these are just the beginning. Apparently, whether you seek maps, audio files, illustrations, or films, you will find them all in this amazing place. You gently close your laptop and stow it next to the bed, turning off your little bedside lamp. Snuggling down into the covers, you turn over and gaze out the window. You're on an upper floor far above the ground, but the ambient light of the city makes its way into your darkened room, making rectangular patterns on the floor. It's surprisingly quiet all the way up here. The sounds of the city intrude only distantly through the thick walls of the building. This apartment is a cozy fortress that protects you from the constant heartbeat of the city outside. Your eyelids begin to feel heavy. You nestle your face into the crisp white pillowcase, breathing a few deep sighs. In your mind's eye, you imagine standing in front of the handsome Bozar marble building you will see tomorrow in the very heart of the city. The library is famous for being a perfect example of this turn-of-the-century style. Featuring many of the elements of classical architecture, Bozar buildings like the library also have more ornate Renaissance-era flourishes that enhance their beauty sometimes to jaw-dropping effect. You envision the wide stairs leading you between the library's famous guardians, the lions called Patience and Fortitude. You see yourself standing at the top of those stairs under the neoclassical arches of the entryway. In your mind, as you pause there, it is almost nightfall. As the gloom of twilight descends, the air has that wet, cold feeling that tells you snow is coming. All is quiet, but you have a sense of anticipation something is about to happen. Looking around, you realize that the front steps of the library are uncharacteristically deserted. In fact, there is not even any traffic driving by on the street. You are entirely alone here. Or, perhaps you are not. You cannot believe your eyes, but one of the lions, Patience, has moved from his pedestal and is calmly licking his paw nearby. As if noticing you are looking at him, the majestic marble beast 
stops bathing himself, and yawns at you, rolling over on his side in a friendly way. You automatically look for the other lion, Fortitude, and realize he is walking in a circle some distance away. He's playfully chasing a windblown leaf that is scudding across the stairway. In short, the imposing guardians of the library are lolling about like two enormous kittens. You feel oddly unafraid of these friendly-looking cats, and you watch as Fortitude lets his leaf fly away. He sits for a moment, watching it go, and then turns and ascends the steps in an unhurried manner. Then he sits down by the front door and looks at you as if he's waiting. You are oddly compelled to follow him, and you slowly walk up the stone stairs. You hold out your hand, and he dips his head as if inviting you to pat his soft fur. He no longer looks like a cold marble lion. Instead, he is radiating warmth and softness. You bury your palm in his silky mane, and he leans into your hand. After accepting your greeting, he pushes at the front door with his nose, dislodging it ever so slightly. Intrigued, you reach out and attempt the door yourself. It is unlocked. You open the door wide and fortitude dips under your arm and enters the grand foyer inside, as if expecting you will follow. You look behind you and see patience waiting nearby. You open the door wider, and he slides gracefully through the opening as well. Taking a deep breath, you enter the building and let the door close behind you. You stand in the echoing entryway in awe, gazing up at the ornate carvings on the tall ceiling and reading the names of the donors etched on the walls. As if someone was expecting you, the tall candelabra light fixtures are illuminated. There is also a warm light glowing from the balcony on the second floor that overlooks the foyer. Turning around, you admire the very tall, arched windows over the front doors. Grey twilight filters through the glass. Formidable columns hold up the ceiling, but it feels as if it is weightless, soaring in graceful arches above your head. This building has a feeling of permanence but it also conveys a mood of effortless space. As you turn in circles, taking in the majesty of this entryway, you realize that patience is ambling in your direction. 
he has a lanyard hanging around his neck. The friendly lion sits just an arm's length away, and you reach out to examine his new neckwear. It is an ID pass card. Scrutinizing it more carefully, you are amazed to see that it has your name and photograph on it. You gently remove the lanyard from your feline companion, pulling it over his head. Having delivered his gift, he goes wandering into the recesses of the hallway. You don your new ID card, pulling it firmly over your own head and tugging on it as if to confirm that it's real. Looking up, you realize both lions have disappeared down the dimly lit first floor corridor. Having never been inside the library, you're not sure what to explore first, so you follow them into a wing that leads south. The lights of the city stream into the enormous arched window at the end of this long hallway, which glows with the light from large hanging pendants. Looking up, you are transfixed by the ornate decorations on the ceiling. You recall reading that they were made of plaster, but it looks for all the world like carved wood. The artistry is stunning. Bringing your gaze down again, you see the silhouettes of the lions as they move down the corridor and then disappear into a room to the left. Passing through the doorway behind them, you instantly recognize this space, which you read about yesterday. You can tell you are inside the beautiful periodical room. As much as any space in the library, you know this room is a window on the modern world. However, the cozy warmth of the furnishings also makes it feel like you've stepped into the past. Long wooden tables, now empty, are lit by low golden lamps. Elaborate woodwork graces the walls, framing a series of murals. These paintings all appear to be by the same artist, although they vary quite a bit in size. Making a circle around the room, you realize that they depict famous buildings in New York that are related to publishing. It seems a fitting subject for the periodical room. You pull out a chair and sit down on it, spreading your hands across the smooth wooden surface of the table. Then you look around the room, imagining it full of people who are reading newspapers from all over the world. The room almost hums with its own importance as if it were waiting for another day to dawn and another influx of fresh publications to arrive. Turning your head to the right, 
you can see into a long room with more rich wood and more study tables. In contrast to the periodical room, this soaring space has white pillars that create a sense of light amidst the wood and dark plaster. Its round hanging chandeliers make you feel like you're looking into a medieval great hall. You pick up a paper map from a nearby display stand and discover that this is the part of the library specifically dedicated to Hebraica and Judaica. You could stay all evening in just these two rooms, but there is more for you to see. Patience and fortitude have vanished back into the shadows of the main hallway. You step quietly after them, as if your very footsteps might disturb the tranquility of these venerable rooms. Looking down the hallway in the northerly direction, you see fortitude staring at something on the wall. Intrigued to see what it is, you approach. When you arrive, you discover an elegant marble drinking fountain. The water flows through a golden lion's head. Fortitude cocks his head curiously to the side, appearing to consider this water-producing likeness of himself. You stand reverently for a moment, thinking that it is the grandest drinking fountain you've ever seen in your life. At this moment, Fortitude seems to have seen enough. He turns and disappears down a nearby corridor. You're about to follow, but your eye is drawn to a heavy, double wooden door. Above it, in gold lettering, are the words Map Division. You pull down on the lever handles, and the doors open without complaint. You find yourself in the most opulent room yet. The familiar, ornately carved wood surrounds you, but it's topped by the beautiful blue walls and a richly decorated gilded ceiling. In the recesses of the room, you see bookshelves with neatly organized tomes. A gentle light emanates from the ceiling chandeliers, inviting you to spread out many maps and peruse them. The soaring arched windows are here as well. You can see the lights of the city outside, twinkling through the glass in the darkness. You recall reading that there are some 20,000 books and atlases available here, ranging from the 16th to the twenty-first centuries. Much like the periodical room, this feels like a space where you could have access to far-off places. There are city maps, antiquarian maps, topographic maps. The materials here allow you to travel across the world 
and across the centuries. It's hard to conceive how many maps are in this room. You don't want to lose track of your lion guides, so you slip back through the double doors and pull them softly closed behind you. You see that Patience is sitting there waiting for you. As you appear, he turns and walks back in the direction of the entryway. In a moment, you find him sitting in front of another door. The first time you walked the hall, you hadn't even noticed this entrance. Its doors are not heavy wooden ones like the others. Rather, they are made of elegant glass, clearly legible in gold lettering. It says, Treasures, the Polonsky Exhibition. Peering inside, you see a room full of classical pillars and arches with artfully arranged display cases. The light in the room is dim, but each display is illuminated so that the item inside is visible. The glass doors give the interior hall the feeling of being in a carefully preserved vacuum, where all its priceless objects must be protected. On this night, no door seems off limits to you. Wrapping your hand thoughtfully around the card at your neck, you gently push the doors of the exhibit open and let yourself in. You're standing in a breathtaking space. Many marble columns and pilasters in the classical style are holding up an intricately carved wooden ceiling. The geometric coffers in the ceiling soar above the marble walls and floor. The overall effect is a feeling of both gravity and lightness. It takes you a moment to draw your eyes away from the features of the room itself and focus on the treasures within. The exhibition, at first, seems like a random collection of items, including art pieces, documents, furniture, and even toys. Curious to discover what connects them, you begin to wander. You stop in front of a handwritten document that is browning with age in places. You can see the folds across the middle where it was once creased. Reading the information, you discover this is an actual copy of the Declaration of Independence, written by the hand of Thomas Jefferson. We hold these truths to be self-evident, you whisper to yourself as you try to make out the fine script. You've heard the words many times, and now it seems as if they are calling to you, down through the centuries. You take a deep breath and hold it as if to avoid leaving your mark on this delicate document. Then you exhale, smiling to yourself. 
the artifact is safe inside its climate-controlled case. A little way ahead, you stop and examine the Hunt Lennox globe. This is one of the oldest known globes of the Earth. Because it was created just after Columbus's first voyage, it omits North America. You vaguely recall that this globe is notable for being only one of two that ever bore the notation, Here be dragons. Your eye roams the brown and detailed terrain of this marvelous old piece. It shows a partial world, really, a time when the imagination was all that could complete the map. Your eye is drawn to the most massive and colorful book you've ever seen. In keeping with the theme of early exploration, the title is Birds of America by John James Audubon. You further discover that it is the largest book in the New York Public Library, and in fact, one of the largest ever printed. Apparently, Audubon had wanted to draw every bird species in North America. This book was a bold effort to show them to scale. The colors in this piece are a feast for the eyes. It could easily be the most sumptuous book you've ever seen. Even your special ID card will not enable you to pull this treasure from its safe display case and page through it. However, you imagine yourself sitting with it for hours, soaking up its beauty. Reluctantly turning away from it, you approach a long case that contains numerous items. The theme seems to be literary, but there are many precious manuscripts and drawings here. It doesn't take you long to zero in on what turns out to be Shakespeare's first folio. What most people don't realize is that it was published after Shakespeare's lifetime, yet it contains 18 plays that had never appeared in print before. Had it not been for this remarkable book, plays such as Macbeth and The Tempest would have been lost. Even though the volume contains a reasonably accurate portrait of Shakespeare himself, his friend Ben Johnson writes in the introduction that a reader seeking to know him should look not upon his picture, but his book. And you do look upon this book with wonder thinking about how it set the course for literature in the ensuing centuries. How lucky you are to see it in person. Circling around the display case, you pass by several precious books and manuscripts you recognize by their titles. However, there is also a walking stick, which seems a bit out of place among these other items. The plaque 
says that it once belonged to author Virginia Woolf. You recall reading that the library also owned a large collection of Woolf's manuscripts and letters. Seeing the walking stick makes her seem so present and real. You are quite moved. You've just made a complete circuit around this case of literary wonders when you spy something curious all the way across the room. Almost tiptoeing on the marble, you set a course for a small display case along the back of the hall. Inside it are a plucky band of well-loved stuffed animals. You don't need a plaque to tell you what they are. You can see clearly Winnie the Pooh, Eeyore, a teeny tiny little piglet, Kanga and Tigger. These are the original playmates of Christopher Robin Milne who inspired the classic stories with his playtime adventures. Seeing Pooh and his friends, you are flooded with happiness. It's so sweet to remember a time when stories held such magic. You think to yourself that Christopher Robin's father, A. A. Milne, truly offered a priceless gift to the children of the world with his writing. Without any sense of time passing, you continue your trip around the room, taking in treasured items that celebrate pioneers in the areas of equality and civil rights. You see letters, postcards, manuscripts, and photos of key historical figures and events. You feast your eyes on sculpture and sheet music by great composers. So much is contained just in this one exhibition a testament to all the New York Public Library has preserved for everyone. When you've finally seen the entire exhibit, you realize that you don't know where your lions have gone. Gently pushing open the doors that lead back to the hallway, you see patience and fortitude strolling casually about the entrance hall, waiting for you. The arched windows over the library entrance let in a soft white light from outside, but most of the foyer is glowing with the golden illumination from the candelabra fixtures. As you approach, the lions slowly rise and walk towards one of the grand marble staircases that flank the room, leading to the second floor. You're looking forward to seeing the upstairs, especially the grand spaces on the third floor. Patience and fortitude seem to know this, Without stopping, they pass through the next level and continue to the top where some of the library's greatest delights still await you. As you finish climbing the stairs, your eyes are drawn to the ceiling of the third floor rotunda. Like other rooms in the library, 
The walls are richly covered in carved wood, lending this soaring space a feeling of warmth and intimacy that belies its size. The tall ceilings are the most remarkable detail, however. They are painted with beautiful murals that remind you of an Italian church. The figures in the murals float effortlessly in the sky, surrounded by gold detailing. Bringing your gaze down, you see that the room in front of you is called the Public Catalogue Room. You leave the rotunda behind and walk through the doors into its large open spaces. Not to be outdone by the rotunda, this dignified room has a stunning mural covering much of the ceiling. Framing the mural is another elaborately decorated ceiling accented in gold. Massive chandeliers hang from it, generously lighting the space. The room is filled with long desks that have computers on them. You know that many years ago, there were actual card catalogue files here. You stand wistfully in the centre of this portal, which gives the world access to all the research materials the library has to offer. You think about how you would like to feel the old card drawers slide open and flip through their contents, just like everyone did decades ago. Of course, a modern system of cataloguing materials has its advantages. How else could the library offer so many resources? What intrigues you so much is that the domain of the library is much greater than what meets the eye. In fact, 120,000 square feet of storage space and 84 miles of bookshelves are nestled safely underneath nearby Bryant Park. You're amazed to find that this is enough to accommodate 3.2 million books and half a million reels of microfilm. All this compact storage is made possible by the novel method of storing items by size rather than by title or subject. Apparently, grouping like-size items together increases the storage capacity by 40%. All of this is just sitting no more than six feet below the lovely grounds where New Yorkers stroll, relax, and dine together in the park behind the building. It is the most fabulous secret, you think. But the tale of the park storage holds even more delightful revelations. In fact, the method of delivering materials from under Bryant Park into the library is via a plucky little train. Librarians are stationed in this climate-controlled underground bunker, where they await materials requests. Then, they load the materials into little red cars 
that are decorated with an image of a lion and send them chugging up to the appropriate room in the building above. An item could make this trip within an hour, magically appearing indoors without a chaperone, riding the rails to meet its eager recipient. This truly is a place of wonders, you muse. Your lions aren't in the catalogue room with you anymore, but you have no doubt where they have gone. You are filled with delicious anticipation as you face the door to the most famous room in the library, the one you've most yearned to see. Patience and fortitude have preceded you into the famous Rose Reading Room. The space is divided down the middle by a circulation desk, so you have to decide whether to turn left or right. This, the largest room in the library, stretches 78 feet wide and 297 feet in length. That's nearly the size of an American football field. You choose to enter the right-hand half of the hall, where you stand under the 52-foot ceiling and gaze up in wonder at the artistic masterpiece above. Turning slowly in a circle, you admire the three gorgeous murals. Each is embedded in its own intricate tray of the ceiling. The scenes are filled with cherubs, frothy clouds, and gold detail. Huge rosettes frame each mural like decorations on a cake. In contrast with other parts of the library, this room lacks the usual supporting columns. The ceiling appears to defy gravity, levitating effortlessly far above. Due to clever feats of engineering, no support columns are needed. The lavish and unbroken space openly invites the visitor in. It says, Welcome, there is room for everyone here. And there is certainly room for you tonight. On any other day, you would share this space with countless readers, researchers, and visitors. The sound of turning pages and tapping keyboards would hover all around you, and that is usually a comforting aspect of the library. Tonight, however, you will have a rare and secret experience. This room this masterpiece of architecture, one of the greatest spaces in any library in the world, is just for you. Your eyes scan the majestic windows, and you see that a gentle snowfall has arrived. Impossibly large, downy flakes are drifting gracefully across every pane of glass. You are filled with a sense of quiet joy and the comforting feeling of being cocooned inside a luxurious snow globe. Only you 
are allowed inside. The entire center of the room is filled with long wooden tables. Each is warmly lit by lamps that are spaced at intervals, casting just the right amount of golden glow. Best of all, in a nod to the true charm of libraries everywhere, there is an open stack selection of reference books that lines the perimeter of the entire room. Any of the 600 people who might be in the room at a given moment may walk up and consult these books without a librarian. Luckily for you, there are not 600 people here tonight. The entire collection of beautiful books is yours to peruse. You turn to your right and slowly scan the shelves. The first stack is filled with materials about American literature. You pluck one book from that shelf and tuck it under your arm. The next row of books is all about English literature. You choose a volume based entirely on the fact that it's a color you like. Circling to the other side of the room, you come upon Roman literature, and then in a second row of bookshelves behind it, you choose an item from Social Sciences. When you've walked the full circuit of the room, you cradle the stack of books in your arms and stroll to the very center, choosing a spot at the end of one of the long study tables. You lay down one of the books, running your hand over its cloth-bound cover and straightening it nicely in front of the chair. Then you walk a few spots further and set down another one of your books. You do this until all the books have a place. You pause with a great feeling of satisfaction. Starting at the beginning again, you sit in front of the first book, tucking your chair comfortably under the table. You gently flip it open, inhaling its intoxicating old paper scent. You wonder to yourself how long it's been since another reader selected this book and what they were researching when they did. The volume has pretty illustrations. You begin turning the pages, and then settle in to complete a chapter. Every word fascinates you. You don't know how much time passes as you lose yourself in the book. After a while, you remember that you have other books here too. With a decadent feeling, you close this one and survey the rest. You stand up carefully pushing your chair back in its place under the table. Then you change seats. 
this new vantage point has you facing the other side of the room. You run your hand across the carved edge of the table, feeling the detailed design that adorns it. Lifting your chin, you peer out of the windows. The snow falls silently and heavily without stopping. Delighted by your ongoing privacy, you confidently open the second book and begin to pore over it. The paper feels thick and substantial between your fingers as you turn page after page. At some point, you look around for patience and fortitude. Like sentinels, they are lying in the doorway. They are not asleep, but they appear to have settled in, as if you are expected to stay for some time. As you watch, Patience rests his head on his paws and blinks his eyes slowly. You stand up from your chair and walk to the information desk that divides the room in half. There is nobody there, but you can see the little red circulation train parked inside. It has one volume standing in it, and you feel you absolutely must see what this book is. Once again wrapping your hand around the ID tag at your neck, you slide across the counter and stand inside the circulation desk. Picking up the book from the train, you see it is a collection of fairy tales. Delighted, you take the book and let yourself out of the circulation booth. Not wanting to leave any part of the Rose Reading Room unseen, you enter the left-hand side and choose one of the many identical empty places at yet another long table. There, you settle comfortably into your chair, and by the glow of the lamp, you begin to read. Castles, princesses, magic spells, and heroic quests unfold before you. Time loses all meaning, and this snowbound night in the library is all you know. You're not sure when it happens, but you have fallen asleep. Your eyes are closed, and your head is resting on something soft. At first, you imagine it is one of your lions. As you become more alert, however, you realize it is a pillow. Opening your eyes, you find you are in your friend's cozy bedroom on the upper west side, and the snow is falling heavily through the lamplight outside. Closing your eyes again, 
you realize that you must have been dreaming. But the visions you had felt so detailed, so real, and you yearn to be back within the walls of the library once again. Snuggling into your downy pillow, you invite sleep to return. You imagine yourself once again ensconced in that magical palace of books. With patience and fortitude as your companions, you are again privy to every conceivable masterpiece of the written word. You pull the cover up and tuck it around your shoulders. Then, happily, your dream continues.